welcome to Time Travelling Team, the weekly podcast where we review every episode of Doctor Who right from the very beginning. I'm Trisha. And I'm Paddy. This week we join the Doctor, Romana and K9 for the final, final story of Season 17, Shada. As usual, we'll be discussing the Doctor, the companions and the villains and give your thoughts on the story as a whole. We'd also love to hear your thoughts on this story as well as on the entirety of Season 17. So to join the discussion, you can check us out at Time Team. That's T-I-M-E-T-E-A-M-P on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Or you can email us at timetravellingteam at teamproductions.com. Now though, Paddington, if you would please do us the honours of the story recap. I will indeed. Part 1. In a space station orbiting a giant red star, six men sit hooked into a central node. A timer goes off and one of the men wakes up while the other's odd experience fits. The man smiles as he watches the others suddenly go still. He then goes to a control bank and activates an emergency broadcast that indicates the station, which is a research hub for the foundation of the study of advanced sciences, is under quarantine and should not be approached. He then reaches out and a sphere from the top of the central node floats into his hand, with muffled voices emitting from it. He then leaves and a short while later the other five men wake up, but they are all disorientated. The man then gets into his ship and flies away from the station. On Earth, a young man makes his way through the corridors of St. Seds College, Cambridge, and asks for directions to the office of Professor Cornotus. He enters the seat in a state of disarray, with books and stacks of papers everywhere, as well as a large blue police box in the corner. Cornotus, an absent-minded elderly man, offers some tea, which the student accepts before introducing himself as Chris Parsons, saying that they met at a faculty event a few weeks previously. Cornotus greets him before giving out about how boring faculty events are. He starts to tell Chris on the experience he had with the third most recent master of the college, a fact which Chris finds confusing as it would have been nearly a hundred years ago. He cuts off Cornotus by saying that he came to borrow a few books the professor had promised to lend him. Cornotus shows him where the books are before going to fetch the tea. However, Chris says that he must attend a seminar and leaves, promising to bring the books back the following week. Before he goes, he asks about the police box and Cornotus says that someone must have left it there while he was away. Elsewhere, the Doctor punts a boat down the River Cam, discussing with Roman and some of the greatest ever students to come out of Cambridge Colleges. The Doctor talks about his enjoyment of the simplicity of river punting compared to piloting the TARDIS. Unfortunately, the pole becomes lodged in the riverbed, and the Doctor hurriedly says that he should head back to Cronotus' office. As he paddles away, Roman asks if he can hear voices, but he says that he can't. Unbeknownst to them, they are being observed by the man from the space station, who is now wearing a flamboyant white cape and carrying the sphere in a carpet bag. Later, Chris returns to his lab at the physics department and puts down the book Cronotus lent him. After he turns away, the book slides off the stack that he had put it on, drawing his attention. He opens it up and sees that it is written in an alien language. As he flicks back and forth through the pages, he fails to notice the time on the clock on the wall going backwards and forwards in unison with the page flicking. He takes up a magnifying glass, but the book shuts itself. He then picks up a scalpel, but as he goes near it, the book dodges him. Back at St. Seds College, the Doctor and Romana encounter Wilkin, one of the college porters, who tells him Cronotus is back in his office. The Doctor asks Wilkin how he knew that they would ask about the Professor, and Wilkin says that that is who the Doctor has asked for every time he has come to visit the college. They arrive at the office, where Cronotus enthusiastically greets them and offers them tea. He reveals to Romana that he is also a Time Lord, and has been on the staff of the college for nearly 300 years. Romana asks how he has stayed there so long, and he says that the staff are very discreet. He then asks why they are here, and they reply that they came to answer his distress call, but he says that he never made one. The doctor then asks who sent the signal if it wasn't him. Meanwhile, the mysterious man enters the college campus and rudely demands that Wilkin tell him where Cronotus is. Wilkin refuses to tell him anything, saying that he does not wish to be disturbed whilst entertaining the doctor. In his office, Cronotus says that he could have sent it, but he can't remember when or why he did it. The doctor asks if it had anything to do with the voices Romana heard, which he says sounded like ghostly screams from humans. Cronotus says that that was probably students playing a prank, and he instead says that the distress call was about a book. At that moment, Chris puts the book into an x-ray machine, but it explodes after a few seconds. He tries to retrieve the undamaged book, but burns his hand on it, and then goes to tend to it. After he leaves, the book starts to glow. Elsewhere, the mysterious man asks for a driver for a lift, but during their travels, he takes control of the car and drives past St. Seds. Inside his office, Cronotus, the Doctor and Romana all pauses to each hear the voices that Romana described. The Doctor asks if the voice has anything to do with the book Cronotus is so worried about. Cronotus admits that he accidentally brought the book back with him from Gallifrey, a fact which shocks the others as they remind him of the dangers that it could pose if it fell into the wrong hands. 
Cronota says it was an accident and that he had summoned the doctor in the hopes that he would bring it back to Gallifrey due to his own inability to return. Meanwhile, the mysterious man drives to the middle of a field and gets out of the car before entering his craft, which is now completely invisible. He asks the ship for all the available information on the doctor. He decides that the doctor doesn't pose a threat to him and he says once he gets the book, nothing will stop him. He then communicates with another ship and a silhouetted figure asks what is his bidding. Part 2 Back in Cronotus' office, the Doctor and Romana help the Professor in the search for the book. The Professor tells them that the title is The Worshipful and Ancient Law of Gallifrey. The Doctor is shocked by this and demands to know how the Professor managed to sneak it out of the Panopticon. He says that he took it because he thought that no one would miss such an old tome. The Doctor takes him aside and says that the book is one of the ancient artifacts of Rassilon. He says that in the wrong hands that book could be devastating, but Cronotus says that it is highly unlikely anyone would be able to decipher its secrets. Elsewhere, Chris is in a phone booth making a call to one of his colleagues, Claire, and he informs her about the book. He assures her that he is not mad and tells her to come to the lab immediately. Back in Cronotus' office, the Doctor and Romana continue to go through the Professor's library but are unable to find the book. The Doctor talks about the symbolism of the ancient artifacts of Rassilon, and even though their secrets have been forgotten, they are still part of the pomp and circumstance of the Citadel. He berates the Time Lords for their ostentatiousness, but Romana says that not all the Time Lords are the same, reminding him of the renegade Time Lord, Salyavan. The Doctor admits to having admired the notorious criminal for his sense of style and panache, saying that he may have modelled himself on him a bit. Romana asks if he ever met Salyavan, but the Doctor says that he was in prison long before he attended the Academy, but becomes confused when he can't remember where he was imprisoned. The Doctor calls out to Cronotus to see if he knows anything about the prison's location, but Cronotus ignores the question and instead reveals that he suddenly remembered his encounter with Chris. However, he can't remember his name and the Doctor Romana try to help him. Meanwhile, Claire meets Chris at the lab and examines the book for herself. Together, they realise that the book defies the laws of established scientific principles. Claire suggests that he go back and ask Cronotus about it and Chris reluctantly agrees, saying that that would be the smart thing to do. He tells her to make herself at home whilst he goes back to St. Seds. In Cronotus' office, the Professor finally remembers Chris's name and tells the Doctor where to find him. The Doctor tells Romana to stay behind, and if he isn't back in two hours, then she is to take Cronotus into the TARDIS and send out an emergency distress call. The Doctor takes a nearby bicycle and makes his way to Chris's lab, nearly colliding with him at one point, but both parties cycle on. The Doctor arrives at the lab and Claire asks if he is looking for Chris. The Doctor spots the book and Claire asks him about it, but he evades her questions. However, he becomes interested when she mentions the equity machine and introduces himself to her before asking to see it. He takes a look at the damaged machine and says that the book must have been storing vast amounts of subatomic energy that was released when it was scanned. Claire then takes a printout of a carbon dating test she took of the book, which reads that it is minus 20,000 years old. The doctor says that he will need to take the book with him. Meanwhile, the mysterious man, now wearing normal street clothes, returns to St. Seds and encounters Wilkin, who confirms that Cronotus is now alone. He goes to Cronotus' office, who summons him uh, when he hears a knock on the door, thinking that there's another group of students due to voices emanating from the sphere. Once inside, the man demands to be given the book, and Cronotus demands to know who he is before claiming ignorance of the book. The man says that he will take the location of the book from him by force, and sends the sphere to extract the information from Cronotus' brain, telling him that he will die if he resists it. Once he gets the information he seeks, the man leaves the unconscious Cronotus on the floor. A short while after he leaves, Romana emerges from the TARDIS, having gone inside earlier to find some milk for the tea. Kristen enters and demands to know what is going on. Romana asks K9 to check if Cronotus is still alive, and K9 says that he is alive, but in a coma. Romana asks Chris who he is, and once he reveals his connection to Cronotus, she asks if he has the book or met the doctor. Before the confused Chris can respond, K9 says that Cronotus was subjected to a psychoactive extraction and that part of his mind was stolen. Romana puts Chris to use and tells him to go get a medical cabinet from inside the TARDIS, giving him directions on how to find it. After he returns, Romana takes an electronic collar out of the kit and places it on Cronotus' neck. She explains that it will take over the normal automatic brain functions, allowing that part of his brain to become the thinking part. Chris says that that is impossible, but Romana reveals Cronotus' alien nature. On the man's ship, he uses the sphere to scan through Cronotus' memories, finding the one of Chris coming to ask for a book. In Cronotus' office, Romana says that Cronotus doesn't seem to be getting any better, and K9 says that he c- can't detect any increased cerebral activity. 
She then asks K9 to amplify his heartbeats and they hear an irregular beat coming from his twin hearts. Romana realises that he is manipulating them to send a message in Gallifrey and Morse code. She decodes the message as Beware the Sphere, Beware Skagra and Beware Shada. She starts to decipher the next part of the message, revealing the location of a secret, but the beating stops and K9 says that he has died. Meanwhile, the Doctor is making his way back to St. Seds when he is confronted by the man, who reveals that he is Skagra. He demands the book, threatening to use the sphere on the Doctor. The Doctor cycles away, pursued by the sphere. During the chase, the book falls out of the bicycle's basket, but the Doctor fails to notice as he continues towards the college. Skagra picks up the book as the sphere continues its pursuit of the Doctor, who is dismounted and tried to hide from the sphere in the back alleys. However, he is cornered by the sphere as he attempts to escape under a locked gate. Part 3 Before the sphere can attach itself to the Doctor, the TARDIS materialises and the sphere retreats. Romana opens the door and summons the Doctor inside. They dematerialise and appear back in Cronotus's office where they discover Chris by himself. The Doctor asks where Cronotus is and Chris says that his body disappeared moments before they arrived. The Doctor says that he must have been on his final regeneration and then mentions his encounter with Skagra. Chris and Romana tell him about the message that Cronotus left and the Doctor seems to recognise the word Shada but can't remember it exactly. He then vows to make Skagra pay for killing his friend and he tells K9 to keep alert for any activity from the sphere, instructing him to trace the signal. He then tells everyone that all they can do now is wait in the TARDIS. A short while later, the sphere attacks a man fishing, stealing his mind and causing him to fall into the water where he drowns. The attack is detected by K9 and the TARDIS dematerializes moments before Claire arrives looking for Chris. She calls out for him in Cronotus and then spots one of Chris's things. Unsure of what to do, she leaves the office. The TARDIS lands in the field near the cloaked ship and the Doctor Nearers watches the sphere disappears inside it. The sphere goes to Skagra and shows him the playback of its encounter with the Doctor and reveals the existence of the TARDIS. The ship gives him the technical readouts of the TARDIS before alerting him to the presence of the Doctor and the others. Skagra orders the ship to let them approach. Outside, the Doctor bumps into the cloaked ship, giving out to K9 for not warning him. However, K9 says that he assumed that he could see it, but admits to a curious Romana that he is unable to scan it properly due to its highly advanced nature. Chris then spots a long red carpet nearby, and when they go to it, K9 says that he has detected a door opening. The Doctor then leads the way inside the ship, followed by the others. Inside, they make their way down a long corridor. The Doctor suggests that the others go back, but Romana refuses to leave him alone. A few moments later, she and Chris and K9 are abducted by a strange cube that fades from sight just as Skagra appears. Skagra assures the Doctor that they are safe for the moment and then leads him further into the ship. Back at St. Seds, Claire bumps into Wilkin and asks if he has seen Cronotus. The porter says that he hasn't seen him but promises to take a message for him on her behalf. Claire tells him about the book and he initially mistakenly thinks that she means that the book is controversial. However, she explains the true extent of its danger, saying that it is currently absorbing radioactive energy. He tells her to go back to Cronosa's office and that he will ring her own to find the professor. On the bridge of the ship, the doctor demands to know what Skagra has done with Cronosa's mind, informing him that he died as a result of the extraction. Skagra coldly says that he only cares about Cronosa's mind, saying that it will serve as a, gr- a greater purpose on his behalf. The Doctor demands to know who Skagra is, but he refuses to answer, saying that knowledge will be of no benefit to the Doctor. He then presents the book to the Doctor and orders him to read it. The Doctor says that he would only be bored by his reading voice, but Skagra repeats his demand, threatening to use the sphere on him. The Doctor reads the book in native Gallifreyan and says that it doesn't make any sense. Skagra says that it was clearly written in code and he believes that the Doctor knows what it is. The Doctor says that he is too stupid to know the code, and Skagra agrees, sending the sphere to attack him, which causes the Doctor to scream in pain. Elsewhere, on the ship's brig, Romana asks K9 to scan for the Doctor, but he says that the shielding around their cell is preventing him from doing so. Romana expresses frustration at their situation by saying blast, and K9, taking it as an instruction, fires at the wall, which causes the beam to ricochet around the cell. He apologises, but K- Romana commends him on his attempt. Suddenly, he says that he can hear voices from the sphere, but tells him that the doctor's voice has been added to it. Romana says that she wishes she could get out of the cell, and she suddenly vanishes inside the cube. Chris, thinking that that is the key, repeats the wish but finds it to be ineffective. At that moment, Skagra, now returned to his normal clothes, leads Romana out of the ship, threatening to use the sphere on her if she doesn't cooperate. 
He takes her to the TARDIS and forces her inside after opening with the Doctor's key. Back in Cronos' office, Claire looks through the various drawers and cupboards for any clues as to the origin of the book and the location of Chris and Cronotus. She uncovers a secret compartment that reveals a control panel. When she touches one of the switches, the panel flashes and the whole room shakes, knocking her to the floor. A few moments later, Wilkin arrives at the office and knocks on the door. When he gets no answer, he opens the door and is greeted by the sight of a shimmering blue void. Back on the bridge of Skagra's ship, the doctor wakes up and calls out for Skagra. The ship tells him that Skagra has left and then refuses to say where they have gone, saying the doctor poses a threat to its master. The ship then asks how the doctor is alive and he reveals that he tricked the sphere into believing that he was stupid as he was claiming to be. He says that the sphere did not use its full power on him and therefore took a false imprint of his mind. He then asks where his friends are, highlighting the fact that the ship believed him to be dead and therefore can no longer be a threat to Skagra. The ship agrees and releases them. Suddenly, the Doctor notices that the atmosphere has gotten stuffy and the ship says that as the Doctor is registered as dead, it turned off the air supply to the bridge as dead men do not need oxygen. The Doctor collapses to the floor, struggling to breathe. Part 4 in the break, Chris admits defeat and tried to find a way out, but he and K-9 are suddenly transported into the corridor outside the bridge. K-9 says that he senses the Doctor is in danger and leads Chris to the bridge doors, where he tries to blast his way in to put to no avail. Chris manages to get the door open and they rush inside, where the ship restores the oxygen supply. The Doctor wakes up and asks for Romana, but Chris says that he doesn't know where she is. The Doctor angrily throws a bag of jelly babies. He then asks K-9 where the TARDIS is and the robot dog replies that it is gone. Chris says that Skagra probably needed a man to pilot the TARDIS, but the Doctor says that Skagra can pilot it by himself using the imprint of the Doctor's brain. Chris then wonders why the ship is treating the Doctor as if it were actually dead, and the Doctor replies that it operates via blind logic and is incapable of thinking outside of its programming. He then asks the ship where Skagra is, but the ship says that it doesn't have that information. Elsewhere, the TARDIS lands inside a large star cruiser that Skagra says is his command ship. Romana demands to know what he is up to, but rather than answer her, he asks her what she sees out of the viewport. She says that she sees the stars, and he says that the universe is made up of billions upon billions of atoms, all of which are now filled with untapped potential. Romana steps away from him, thinking that he is crazy, but she is stopped by the appearance of a hulking figure from the shadows, which Skagra calls one of his cargs. Skagra then takes her to a nearby room and starts a series of machines. Romana then watches in fascination as a new karg, which is a lumbering eight-foot-tall entity with crystalline scales for skin, is formed. Back on Earth, the Doctor convinces the ship to take them to the last place that Skagger was before he came to Earth. The ship agrees that the order doesn't conflict with its programming and starts the launch sequence, saying that the journey will take almost three months. The Doctor instructs the ship on altering a few of its flight controls and subroutines. Chris then asks what he is doing, and the Doctor says that he has helped the ship create a rudimentary dematerialization circuit, which will reduce their travel time from months to minutes. Unbeknownst to them, a carg is being created in the ship. Meanwhile, Claire regains consciousness in Cronotus' office, but before she has a chance to collect herself, Cronotus, wearing a nightshirt and cap, appears and demands to know what she has done to his TARDIS. He then goes to fetch some tea. He returns a short while later, and Claire asks who he is, and Cronotus tries to explain his nature as a Time Lord and his current place in his own timeline. He thanks her for activating his TARDIS and bringing him back to life, which has also focused his mind. She expresses her confusion, and he says that he is currently existing as a paradox within an anomaly. He then says that they must get the book back from Skagra, as it is the key to locating Shada, the ancient prison planet of the Time Lords. He explains the Time Lords have been hypnotised into forgetting the existence, but they need to stop Skagra from getting there. Claire asks what is being kept there, but Cronotus says that it is a case of who rather than what. On his command ship, Skagra tells Romana that the Doctor is dead, but that his mind lives on inside the sphere, and that he'll use it to decipher the code in the book. Romana asks what is so important about the book, and he says that it is the key to discovering the location of the most feared and reviled criminals in Time Lord society. As he goes through the Doctor's brain scan, he realises that he doesn't know the cipher. Romana says that it's about time he realised it, which causes Skagra to remember that the cipher would include the scientific principle of time. Back on the ship, the Doctor urges the craft to go faster, but they are interrupted by the arrival of the Krag, who goes to attack them for being intruders. 
Canine holds it as bay with his nose laser just as the ship announces that they have reached their destination. Chris asks where they are, but the doctor says that he doesn't know. He then sees a sign saying that they are on the research hub for the foundation of the study of advanced sciences, which is currently in a dilapidated state. They hear a noise from nearby and go to investigate it. They arrive in the room that Skagra had earlier woken up in and see the f- five colleagues, who are now much older with long hair and beards. Chris asks who they are, and the doctor says that they are the victims of Skagra, who had their intelligence stolen by his sphere. He then tells Chris that he needs him to do something important, and hooks him and one of the men up to the central node. He explains that he will let the man use the intelligence centre of Chris's brain in order to tell them what happened. A few moments later, the man wakes up and introduces himself as Caldera. He also names his companions, and the doctor realises that they are all well-respected scientists and doctors in various fields. The doctor asks about Skagra, and Caldera says that this think tank was Skagra's idea. He says that he intends to steal the minds of Salievan, a revelation which terrifies the Doctor. The Doctor wakes up Chris and begins to explain what happened, but suddenly K-9 appears, having depleted his energy holding off the crag. The crag, who is now glowing red and sparky with energy as a result of the absorption of K-9's attack, begins to advance on the Doctor. Part 5. The Doctor tells Chris to try and distract the crag whilst he leads the scientists out. However, the creature doesn't fall for the bait and begins to attack the central node which causes a chain reaction throughout the facility. K-9 leads the way out whilst Chris goes to rescue the Doctor, who was battered aside by the crag in order to kill the others. The trio run down a corridor but find the door at the other end jammed. The Doctor manages to get it open before the crag gets them, and they escape into the ship before the facility explodes. The Doctor laments that they are no closer to finding Skagra, and asks the ship again if it knows where he is going. The ship says that it wasn't given that information, and the Doctor frustratedly says that Skagra must surely have a home to operate from. The ship says that he does, and after some careful wordplay, it agrees to take them there. Meanwhile, in Cronotus' TARDIS, the Professor and his new companion, Claire, try to get the ancient time machine working again. Cronotus says that they need to try and figure things out fast, or he might fade from existence again. She asks him about Sally Avon, and he says that he was a brilliant but albeit hot-headed young scientist who was known for his unusual skills that helped contribute to his criminal reputation. After some more tinkering, Cronotus says that their task is hopeless, as Claire lacks the knowledge required to work on the time machine. She promises that she is a quick study, and this causes Cronotus to make a decision. He tells her that he is about to do something to her, but swears her to secrecy, which she reluctantly agrees to. His eyes then glow yellow, and he asks Claire to name the various pieces of equipment on the control console. She perfectly explains what everything is and how it works, and Cronotus delightedly leads her back to their repairs. Elsewhere, on the TARDIS, Skagra uses the sphere to keep Romana from the control console whilst he pours through the book. He discovers that time turns backwards around the book, and that by turning the pages within the time field generated by the console, it would eventually take them to Shada. He then exits the TARDIS and with Romana and tells one of the crags to make preparations for their arrival at the prison. Later, one of the crags says that a full contingent of the hulking brutes have been created, just as another one leads in the Doctor and Chris, who landed elsewhere on the ship. Skagra demands to know how they got there and how the Doctor survived. The Doctor explains his faking of his death and disrupting the ship's logic, which causes Skagra to angrily threaten him if he interferes further. Doctor mocks his claims of great plans, saying that he has met many despots who wanted to take over the universe. However, Skagra laughingly says that he is naive and that he is striving for something greater. He says that he intends to unite all consciousness in the universe with his own, so that he can merge with the very universe itself as an all-powerful godlike entity. He then tells the Krags to take them away, but the Doctor signals for Chris and K9 to run. However, Romana, not understanding the hint, fails to run and is kept hostage. The Doctor and the others hide in an alcove and wait for the crags hunting them to go past. Chris says that Skagra is insane and the Doctor agrees before leading them back to the TARDIS. They hear the sound of a dematerialization circuit and run towards it and they encounter a wooden door built into the metal wall. They open it and find themselves in Cronotus' TARDIS. After complimenting the Professor on his choice of vehicle, the Doctor tells him that Skagra has the book. Cronotus says that he he can use it to get to Shada, and after some gentle coaxing, the Doctor remembers the existence of the prison planet. He also remembers the extent of Salievan's powers, and realises why Skagra's after him. 
he explains to Chris and Claire that Skagra only has the ability to extract mines but not insert them. But Sialyevin was known for his incredible mental abilities that allowed him to project his own mind into the bodies of others. The Doctor says that if Skagra is successful, then he will be omnipotent and impossible to stop. Cornotus says that they need to follow Skagra, and the Doctor says that they can do it by following his own TARDIS space-time track. Skagra and Romana arrive on Shada, and he uses the computer console to locate Salievin's cell. He leaves a pair of crags on guard, and they make their way to the prison complex. As they make their way down the corridors, Skagra releases a few other inmates from their cryogenic imprisonment in order to use them as guinea pigs in the mine transference. A short while later, Cronotus' TARDIS arrives and the Doctor tells Chris and Claire to remain behind whilst he, Cronotus and K9 go to stop Skagra. After they leave, Claire starts to talk about a suspicion she has about Cronotus, but Chris interrupts her, complaining that they have been treated like kids. However, he admits not being able to grasp the technology around them, but Claire says that she can, or at least she was able to a short while ago, mentioning what Cronotus did to her mind earlier. Meanwhile, Skagra and Romana arrive at Salievin's cell, but just as he opens the door, the Doctor and Cronotus arrive. Skagra tells the crags to keep them back as he goes inside, but to his shock he finds the cell empty. He asks where Salievin is, and in response, Cronotus' eyes glow again, revealing that he is in fact the notorious Time Lord. The Doctor is shocked by the revelation, and Skagra prepares to extract Salievin's mind with the spear. The Doctor tells K9 to destroy it, but after he does so, the fragmented pieces turn themselves into smaller spheres, and one of them attacks Salievin. Skagra then tells the Doctor to watch as he puts his plans into action, and he sends the spheres to extract the minds of the other released prisoners. Just then, Chris and Claire arrive, after having also guessed Cronotus' secret, and one of the spheres attacks Chris. Skagra then orders the enslaved prisoners and Chris to advance on the Doctor. Part 6 The Doctor orders K9 to keep them at bay, and he stuns one of the prisoners. However, one of the crags drags Romana into his firing line, forcing K9 to stop. It then picks up the robot dog and flings him across the room. Romana tells the Doctor to run, and she evades the crag before picking up K9 and fleeing with the Doctor. The Doctor gives out to Claire for not staying in Cronotus' TARDIS and tells her to follow them, which she does reluctantly as she doesn't want to leave Chris. The Doctor starts to lead him towards his own TARDIS, but changes his mind and goes to Cronotus' one instead. Once inside, the Doctor says that Skagra is on the verge of becoming the all-powerful entity he desires to be, saying that he is now in command of a collective consciousness of the greatest minds in the universe as well as Sally Avon's mental abilities. Romana then smiles and reminds the Doctor that his own mind is in the collective as well. The Doctor gives her a medal and a salute for her insight and says that he will come up with a plan to stop Skagra. At that moment, Skagra is in the Doctor's TARDIS with his enslaved trolls and says that he will go back to his base and from there they will be sent out to the populated areas to begin the conversion process. Meanwhile, the Doctor explains his plan to Romana, who says that it is incredibly dangerous and could kill him. He says that they have no other choice and they put his plan into action. They pilot Cronotus' TARDIS into the time vortex where they latch onto the Doctor's one with a force field tunnel. The Doctor then tells Claire to take over the controls whilst instructing Romana to remove the dimensional shields from a specific area in the interior of the TARDIS. Once he is satisfied she has gotten it right, the Doctor walks into the instability and emerges in the force field tunnel between the two TARDISes. However, the added weight of the Doctor in the force field tunnel causes the circuits in the control console of Cronotus' TARDIS to start overheating. Romana gets K9 to try and repair the circuits, but he says that it is impossible to repair them and all they can do is try to stop them from deteriorating further. All of them hold their respective circuits and levers down, but Claire says that hers is getting too hot to hold. Romana tells her to try using a pencil to hold it down and reaches for one from a nearby desk, but is just out of reach. In a moment of poor judgement, Claire lets go of her lever to retrieve the pencil, which causes the tarts to shake and the power console to spark, sending them all crashing to the floor. Outside, the force field tunnel breaks apart and the two TARDISes drift away from each other and the Doctor is sent careening through the vortex. A short while later, Romana tends to a wound on Claire's hand. Claire asks what they should do next and Romana says that they should carry on with the Doctor's plan. K9 says that he has completed his repairs to the control console and Romana says that they had better get started. Meanwhile, the Doctor finds himself in a strange storage room and begins to take various pieces of equipment from the shelves. He crafts together a helmet of some description and leaves the storage room, which is actually within his own TARDIS. He makes his way to the now abandoned console room, as Skagra had earlier landed the ship and disembarked his passengers. 
He apologized for his rough entry into the ship and uses the external view screen to see where they are. He spots Gagra and his horde standing outside Cronotus' TARDIS, which is materialized on the base ship. The Doctor uses his electronic dog whistle to summon K9, who emerges from the other TARDIS. He then exits his own TARDIS and confronts the supply Skagra, who vows to get rid of him once and for all. The Doctor puts on his helmet and switches it on as he engages in a battle of wills with Skagra for the control of the Horde. Skagra summons the Krag to attack the Doctor, disrupting his concentration, but the Doctor orders K9 to hold off the Krag. Once it is hot enough, the Doctor tells K9 to stop firing, and the Krag stumbles back into the room with the vats that the Skagra uses to grow them. Romana pushes it into one of the vats before tampering with some of the wiring on the vats. She then calls out to Claire out of the TARDIS as K9 holds off more of the crags. Together, they each take one of the exposed wires and drop them to the floor, which electrocutes the crags. With his full concentration back, the latter takes control of the horde and sends it towards Skagra. With no other choice, Skagra flees back to this ship and orders it to take off immediately. Back on the base ship, Chris wakes up confused as to what happened and Claire assures him that everything is all right. The doctor asks Romana about the other members of the horde who have fallen unconscious to the floor and she says that they are all right. He says that it will take a few hours to repair their minds but once he is done he will take them back to Shada. Romana is shocked at this but the doctor says that it is for the time lords for them to sort it out. He says that they will soon remember the existence of the prison as they only forgot about it because Cornotus made them do so in order to cover his escape. On the other ship, Skagra finds himself in the brig after being transported there and demands to be let out. However, ship says that it cannot follow any orders that would hurt its master, the Doctor. Skagra breaks down, demanding to be released as the ship tells him about the changes the Doctor made to it. Back in St. Seds, Wilkin brings a police constable to Cronotus' room. The constable is sceptical of his claims that it was stolen in its entirety. However, when they get there, they discover that the room is back in its place, where the Doctor is reading to Romana, Cronotus, Claire and Chris. They all scoff at the idea of the room being stolen, and the constable begins to mock Wilkin until he sees the Doctor's TARDIS parked in the corner. He asks where he got it, but the Doctor and Romana interrupt him by saying goodbye to the others and vowing to keep Cronotus' secret. The constable then asks Cronotus where they got the police box, but he sees that it has disappeared, and Cronotus asks what he is talking about before he offers him some tea. The frustrated constable tells everyone to follow him to the police station. Meanwhile, on the TARDIS, Romana asks where Skagra is from, and the Doctor, tinkering underneath the control console, says that he came from a planet that was populated by a subversive group of cardinals of the High Council of Gallifrey. Romana then expresses her shock at the truth of Cronotus, saying that it is hard to picture a nice old man as a notorious criminal. Just then, the control console sparks with a small explosion, and the Doctor emerges, himself drastically aged. He then ponders his own future, wondering if people would be surprised to know if he, that he was the Doctor when they meet him as a friendly old man, which causes him to burst out laughing. End of the story. So, will I take a rest for possibly 30 seconds before I barge in with my opinion on something? <laughs> We'll hand it over to Trish for the trivia spot for the week. So what have you got for us? So before we go into the trivia proper, I will say that we've sort of mentioned already, and a lot of people who are fans of Doctor Who already know that Shadow was an unaired story. Um, I'll go into a bit more later on about why that is. But usually I give the air date first. (laughs) (laughs) So I need to preempt what I'm about to say. Uh, The planned air date would have been the 19th of January to the 23rd of February 1980. But obviously that never happened. Hmm. A couple of things in terms of how we get to the point where we and Patty are discussing it now as if it had aired. Mm-hmm. So um, in 1992, the existing footage, because some of it was filmed, was integrated with some new linking narration by Tom Baker for a special BBC video release that came out in July of 1992. So anywhere where they didn't have, kind of like Marco Polo a little bit, anywhere Mm. where they didn't have footage, they had linking narration by Tom. Yeah. In 2017, a quote-unquote completed edit of Shadow was reconstructed using live action and animated material to fill in the missing scenes. Voice work was re-recorded and 
Tom recorded the extra live action sequence that Patty mentioned at the end where we see the doctor older because it's 2017 Tom Baker, Mm -hmm. not 1980 Tom Baker who looks very, very different. That final edit was used, or pardon me, that final edit used production material from 1979, 1992, and 2017. And it became available for digital download in November of 2017. The story aired finally on television for the first time in July 2018 when it aired on BBC America. In 2021, a revised version in the original intended format with cliffhangers intact because these previous versions were all like omnibuses. There was like one big long Mm. stint. Was released on the season 17, the collection Blu-ray set. So that's the version I have. It's why me and Paddy were considering it as part of season 17 because the BBC now releases it as part of the season 17 box set. Mm -hmm. They don't, they're not releasing it as like a bonus extra thing. It's just in the box set, same as everything else. Because the work that they've done, and it it may actually sound very straight odd to say it, but the, the way that they've done it, it is fairly seamless the way it goes from live action to animation back to live action back to animation. Yeah, the only giveaway is that the actors sound older. Yeah. Because obviously, like the difference between Shada and something like Macro Terror or mm-hmm. any of the others that we've seen is that there was no audio that they were replacing. Yeah. This was unfilmed gaps in the story that they were mm-hmm. filling with animation and then they got Tom and Lala and everyone else mm. to come in and record the lines. Now, mm-hmm. Tom is actually fairly good because while he obviously sounds older, his voice is Tom's voice. It's like it's very recognisable. I think the majority of them did a really good job of trying to recapture the, mm. the, the, the time. Yeah, I think the only one that strikes a little odd is Lala and that's only yeah. because... And this is just a, gen- a general observation. I think women's voices change more as they age yeah, compared to men's weird. voices as, as a general rule. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, they tend to get deeper mm-hmm. with age more so than yeah. men's do. Um, I'm going to mention this now. <laughs> Another thing that is an option on the Blu-ray set. So when I watch random fact for everyone we've said this before paddy tends to watch these one episode at a time usually a day at a time i watch it in one sitting the whole way through i think we had a couple of exceptions of like 12 parters way back when but now i just watch the story the whole way through so when i go into the dvd or the blu-ray set i just select well first of all i turn on the subtitles because i don't know why i just prefer watching things with subtitles on weird i know um and then I select play all. And so it just plays all the episodes back to back to back to back to back. On the Blu-ray set, to not my subtitles, that was fine. Back to play all. I was given an option. Play all or play all with introduction by Tom Baker. And I was like, I want to see what this introduction is. Because this introduction is, I'm guessing it was part of the thing from 1992. I think it was kind of like the way that... Um... William Russell did the linking stuff yeah. for the crusade. Yeah. So it starts with Tom in a museum. And he sees all of these villains of the past. And it's leading up to him talking about Shada. Right? Mm-hmm. Shada! As he says, a really weird for some reason. But the first thing he sees is a robot. The robot. From his first from story. Mm-hmm. And so (laughs) I had to stop and rewind and play it again and stop and rewind and play it again and then pause and take a photograph (laughs) and send it to Paddy because the doctor is basically talking about how he defeated all of these enemies. And for some reason, (laughs) both the subtitles and just those things like when you read something, it's just the way you're going to hear it forever. I have no idea Mm. what this originally was and Paddy maybe you can listen to it on YouTube later on or something let me know what you think but 
he says, beat you something that in the subtitles came up as beat you cock. Uh, I did watch the linking the intro. It is beat you cock. And it's got to, I don't know the, where the slang comes from, but like it is old English slang and it's like, ah, me old cock, that type of thing. I think it's it's a it's a reference to Is it Liverpoolian because <laughs> it, it quite it quite possibly might be because um flash forwarding um a bit to the future, uh Bradley Walsh's character Graham, mm. uh when he first comes in, he is very like just Bradley Walsh. And <laughs> in one story like he he meets a guy from like the fifties, he goes, Right me old cockle. Like, as if he's like talking to someone on the chase. And yeah, I think that's part of the There's a difference why, between like, cockle and yeah. cock, though. So I was just sat there, yeah. <laughs> just right. listening so... to this one bit over and over again. Um, I'm gonna try something there that hopefully doesn't come up. But um, I, I think I think it's pretty much like just some sort of British informal fr- phrase for like mate or pal or bud or something like that. Probably. Point yeah. is. I was not expecting it. Mm. <laughs> so Paddy got a, a picture sent over to him going, what the hell was this? And I'm sure your response was, what the hell is that? <laughs> well, see, the first, like, all I saw was the message, what the hell is this? And I'm like, am I after fucking, like, sending you a picture of, like, you know, something by accident? Like, <laughs> to, like, take a picture of my arse when, like, my phone was in my back pocket? <laughs> yeah. Um, first random tangent of the day. Right. Yeah. Um, going back into our normal rundown, though, the writer of the story is Douglas Adams, as is well known. Um, this mm-hmm. is the final story that he has written for Doctor Who. He previously wrote The Pirate Planet, and he also co wrote City of Death with producer Graham Williams under the pseudonym David Agnew. And as I discussed last week, this is his final story as script editor. The director of the story is Pennant Roberts. This is story four of six for Pennant. We previously saw his work in The Face of Evil, The Sunmakers, and The Pirate Planet, and we'll see it again in Warriors of the Deep and Time Lash. The original working title of the story was Sunburst, which... That has no connection with anything. (laughs) Um, I want want opal fruits now. (laughs) Um, We'll talk about this more in the character discussion, but Mm -hmm. what doesn't come as a surprise to me is that Cronotus was originally meant to just die in part two. Mm. Uh, but Douglas Adams had become so fond of the character that he decided to bring him back. <laughs> Which, yeah, I can see it. Mm-hmm. The story takes place in October 1979, which happens to be the same month that Hitchhikers was published. And Douglas Adams later reused elements of this story in his novel Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. I've spoken before, and I'll say it again, Doreen James was supposed to design the costumes for the story as well, but she quit after a dispute with Lana Ward on City of Death. That, for some reason, comes up every single story that that happened. Um, The scene where the Doctor is chased by the orb while on his bicycle um, was originally meant to take place at night. Um... I think that would have made filming it a bit more awkward. I think the daytime looks better. Mm. The characters of Chris Parsons and Claire Keekley are named after Douglas Adams' friends, Douglas Adams's friend, Chris Keekley, who was the president of the cha- of the Cambridge Footlights. Oh. Yep. Uh, the think tank space station scientists all have names that are associated with Greek islands. So Caldera, Akrotiri... La Santorini and Thera. I've botched those like there's no tomorrow. <sighs> Apologies. The joke in part one where Cronotus forgets that he has a memory like a sieve was actually taken from a story of Douglas Adams that was published in the 1965 edition of Eagle and Boy's World when he was just 12 years old. So mm. even then he was reusing his old stuff. <laughs> That's mean. Um... Graham MacDonald suggested that there should be a romantic subplot between Romana and Chris. No. But this was ignored, and I'm fucking glad it was. Yeah. 
like people talk about how like the doctor shouldn't have romantic relationships with companions and stuff for Romana I think that's on a whole like different level like no 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 unless no. you're a certain subset of the fan group who think Romana and Leela are great in which case off you go that's fine yeah um while in a pub Tom Baker and Pennant Roberts were approached by the secretary of the St. John's Choiristers, cor- Choristers, Choristers, that's the right word. Um, mm-hmm. And they asked basically if Doctor Who might make use of his choir services. And so Pennant agreed. And that's why there's a random scene <laughs> when the Doctor is cycling through whatever of a choir singing chattanooga choo choo just on the side of the road and he, as he goes past me he dings his bike bell perfectly in time yeah. with the song and tom was actually made an honorary fellow of saint john's college in return huh. when skagra examines the doctor's life we see brief clips from the pirate planet the power of crawl creature from the pit androids of tara destiny of the daleks and city of death Romana 1 is visible in some of these clips, making this one of only two times that both Romanas appeared in the same story. Even oh. though one of them is only in clip form. Yeah. The medal that the Doctor presents Romana is a French medal that I'm going to attempt to pronounce. I'm going to butcher horribly, so as always, I apologise. Uh, the Ordre de l'Economie Nationale, which was created... In January 1954 and discontinued, ironically enough, in 1963. (laughs) At first, Graham Williams felt that the Time Lords had been overexposed before deciding that the story made a good commentary on capital punishment. Hmm. Which was interesting. Uh, The Krags, K-R-A-R-G-S, were initially called Krags, K-R-A-A-G-S, which was meant to be an anagram of Skagra. I think both are difficult to pronounce, so... They are. Kudos to you for doing that. Um, <laughs> the punting scene, which is now going to be difficult to say because of something from last week. Yeah. Um, the scene on the boat. The scene on the boat, yeah. Uh, Tom found that really difficult. He found it really hard to manoeuvre the boat. Because in fairness, punting is a lot harder than it looks. To actually get... The boat going, first of all, mm-hmm. to keep it going steady and going in the right direction. Mm-hmm. It's not just stick a pole in water and push. There's obviously a bit more finesse to it. Yeah. Um, much to Lala's consternation, who's obviously just sat in the boat with him. Um, and the amusement of the spectating undergrads of Cambridge, <laughs> just watching him trying to punt up and down the river, <laughs> which I just love. Going back to the fact that Shadow wasn't complete. Mm-hmm. Why wasn't it finished? So we talked last week about how Graham Williams was not a fan of last week's story. And he was like, shove it in the five spot because we're going to have Shadow as the big story or the big season closer. It'll be great. People forget about the horns of Naimon and they'll just remember Shadow. So what happened to it? Basically, and a lot of people can relate at the time that this is being filmed filmed being recorded it wasn't completed due to labor action at the bbc so basically there was a strike there was industrial Mm. action happening due to a conflict over which union had jurisdiction over the operation this is sounds so weird of an elaborate clock that featured in the bbc's children's program play school now, we have talked before about how industrial action can have an effect on Doctor Who and on shows or whatever. Obviously, mm. at the time we're writing this, we're writing this, recording this. Why can't I speak? At the time we're recording this, there's actually the writer's strike is currently on. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, this is something people are familiar with. But particularly within the BBC and particularly at this time, who was responsible for which thing? was Mm -hmm. very important do you know down to is a villain's costume part of the costuming department or is it a prop Mm. 
So it sounds silly that there was industrial action over a clock, but given the fact that people get paid to do a particular job, people are held to account because of their particular job and they're protected by their union on how they do their job relating to that particular thing, I kind of get it. <laughs> was it was it Brain and Morbius or was it Fang Rock that Tom nearly caused blue murder by fucking moving a ladder out of the way? I think it was Fang Rock. But that's what I mean. Like, so there, there's things like that where, particularly in very unionized industries, mm. which, you know, entertainment is, um, mm-hmm. you know, one group doing something they shouldn't. And like people say, like, oh, like, anyone can move a ladder or so anyone can set the clock. It doesn't matter. And my read of it is that it's not necessarily you did my job. It's if you done my job wrong, I'm the one that gets the fucking brunt of it. Yeah. So stay the fuck away from it. Mm-hmm. Do you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, so that's why it was abandoned. So they stopped filming part way through. Um, Douglas Adams was actually happy that it was abandoned. He didn't think the story was really up to much. Which is crazy when you think about how much the fandom has locked on to this lost mm. Douglas Adams story. Mm-hmm. And Douglas didn't even particularly care. In 1992, he signed the video rights for Shadow by Mistake, um, which is what allowed the BBC to make the direct-to-video version of it with the linking narration by Tom. And he later requested that his name be removed from the video. And he donated his royalties to Comic Relief. He really did not want anything to do with it. Which may explain why you mentioned um, in the in-between sections um, the uh, novelization. The novelization wasn't written by Douglas Adams, mm-hmm. and it wasn't written until thousand. What did you say? It was thousand eleven. Uh, two thousand twelve. Two thousand twelve. So like two thousand published. Yeah. So, which was very similar to was a pirate planet was was the same or wasn't released until way way later yeah um so it's in like I, said, I find it interesting that like shadow is one of these stories that like i was like oh my god they're gonna release shadow oh my god it's amazing amazing, amazing. the guy who wrote it didn't want them to release this which is interesting hmm. um had this story been televised at the time it would have been the first time the gallifreyan language had been spoken in the television show hmm. Um, one thing before we get into our cast of characters is that Shadow was meant to include a number of prisoners, hmm. including Lucretia Borgia, Boadicea. Is that how you pronounce Boadicea? Uh, Bo- yeah, Bo- it's, 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 hmm. it depends on how you spell it, but I think most people will go with Boadicea. Okay, Boadicea. Lady Macbeth, Salome, Rasputin, Nero. And Genghis Khan. Um, I'm going to circle back around to all of this later. <laughs> I, if I remember correctly, I read somewhere that if it had been produced as well, we would have seen a Zygon as a prisoner as well. Yeah, so they we were sh- going to. There was talk of there being, um, like Dalek, X, Cyberman, uh, whatever. Apparently, that was just a rumor, thing? though. All right. Um. It's in, like, the myths section on the TARDIS wiki, so... But, yeah. But, and one. one last bit of trivia, I suppose, we're getting to the character section. This won't be the last time we see Shada uh, in the podcast. No. I was no. leaving that as a surprise for when that happens. Ah, okay. okay. But now, no, no, we can just leave it like that. <laughs> also, I was leaving the second time we see the Romanas. Oh. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so on to our cast of characters. So as hmm. Skagra, we have Christopher Neen. This is his only Doctor Who acting credit. His non-Who credits, though, are long and very nerdy, which I like. There's a lot of nerdy stuff in here. Blake Seven, The A Team, MacGyver, Ghostbusters Two, Babylon Five, Murder She Wrote, Star Trek Enterprise, Star Trek Voyager. And Jag. Now, some people say, Trish, those aren't all nerdy things. No, but they're nerdy for me. <laughs> they're nerdy for well, me. Well, like, but to be fair, like, like, 
Murder She Wrote is it, it, like there's a there's a crossover like between <laughs> nerd culture and Murder She Wrote. Chris Parsons is played by Daniel Hill. There's the only on-screen Doctor Who credit for Daniel, though he was also in a, in the BBC audio story The Stuff of Nightmares. His non-Who credits include Waiting for God, Called the Midwife, Doctors, and No Place Like Home. Uh, there's actually a joke in the in Tom's ninety two opening narration mm. when he talks about Daniel Hill. He's saying he's a, a lovely man. I think he ended up in a nursing home or something such. Uh, his character in Waiting for God runs a nursing home. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So there's an awful lot of in-jokes in relation to the cast in Tom's mm. spiel at the start. Mm. Professor Cronotus is played by Dennis Carey. This is the first of three appearances for Dennis. We'll see him again in The Keeper of Traken and Time Lash. His non-who credits include The Day of the Jackal, The Red Shoes, Play for Today and The Legend of King Arthur. Dennis passed away in 1986. Claire Keatley is played by Victoria Burgoyne. Uh, this is the only Doctor Who acting credit for Victoria. Her non her non You sound like you were trying to say that Welsh town. <laughs> her non Who credits include Howard's Way, Doctor's Daughters, and Death Ship. Lastly, as Wilkin, who we will not be discussing as a character, but we wanted to include in trivia, we have Gerald Campion. This is his only Doctor Who credit. His non-Who credits include Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Department S, Carry On Sergeant, and Billy Bunter of Greyfriars School. Gerald passed away in 2002. He looks like Ronnie Corbett doing an Elton John impression. He does a little bit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when, I, when I saw him, I expected him to break out into Crocodile Rock at any moment. Yeah, I will say, because we're not discussing him as a character, I was expecting that he was like... Cronotus's companion. Yeah. Except when the Cronotus Tardis disappears, he's like, what the fuck? Yeah. Kind of, kind of like um oh Choji and the um, oh, Planet of the Spiders. Yeah. The, the old the old one and Choji. I was kind of expecting that vibe between the two of them. Mm. But yeah, no. He was just a very, very agreeable and understanding he he is uh, what's, he, what's, his, what's his job he I th- he's the he's the porter of porter, the college that's what, that's what yeah about. but he's essentially the boothby of the of saint said's yeah. <laughs> uh. so thank you for all that wonderful trivia as always You're welcome. Um, so we're now going to do the character discussion. Um, so as always, we will have the Doctor. We will have the companions of Romana and K9. Would you add anyone else as companions, or would you leave them all as prominent characters? I'd leave them all as prominent. Because... Okay. Yeah, I'll get into them later. I'll leave them as prominent. Right. So the prominent characters of Cronotus, Chris, Claire, and I put down the ship. Yeah, I can see that. Because I, I felt that the ship has a prominence within the story as an individual. Mm. And then the villain is just Skagra. Yes. Because the Krags, God love them, they're thick as bricks. Like at one point, Skagra comes out and says, I have broken the code. And one of the responds, we can repair it, master. <laughs> that did make me laugh, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that was good. So, we have, as always, we have the Doctor. We do. So, for me, I think my initial impression for the first, like, two episodes was I loved how sweet the Doctor was with Cronotus. Mm. We get the sense that he comes here regularly to visit. Mm-hmm. Or at least yeah. has been here before to visit. Yeah. Um, And he's very respectful. He's very kind he has fun with him. Like, Tom in those scenes is clearly loving it when like he's joking with Romana about the tea and whatever. Mm-hmm. But he's also very cognizant of Kronos' age and mental state. Mm-hmm. So when, even when he's giving out to him and he's berating him and he's sort of saying, like, what were you doing bringing books? Mm-hmm. Like, that could be very dangerous. He wasn't mean and he wasn't harsh and he wasn't accusing. He was very gentle. It does remind me of like 
my mom was a carer for years. Um, but it reminds me of like working with someone with Alzheimer's or something. Mm. So he was very kind and generous and caring, which is really nice to see. Like we haven't really seen the doctor being like getting along well with another time lord, like straight off the bat in yeah. this way since Planet of the Spiders. Yeah. Do you know? Like obviously he gets along with Romana now, but he didn't when he first met her. Mm-hmm. And this is another example of us seeing another Time Lord from the Doctor's past who he has a really good, solid relationship with. And yeah. it's fun and respectful and, you know, unlike the way we saw him in, um, like, the episodes on Gallifrey where he's kind of belligerent, even when he's being respectful, it's a little bit mocking and a little bit tongue-in-cheek mm. or whatever. We don't see that here. It does remind me of John with Campo or Poche or Choji, whatever you want to call him, mm-hmm. um, which I quite liked. Um, in terms of the story as a whole, there's a lot of doctor doctoring, mm-hmm. you know, out thinking computers and villains, sciencing it up, having a bit of fun, having that moment of seriousness, bringing things together, all very good. Um, I did find the concept of him changing a normal ship into maybe not a TARDIS, but like TARDIS adjacent in terms mm-hmm. of like the space drive to be a little bit dangerous, <laughs> but whatever. Um, but the main thing was, and like, this is kind of going back to while I loved the way he was with Chronotus. And obviously we get this setup that the doctor didn't really respect Sally Avon, but was interested in Sally Avon. <laughs> I was surprised he didn't do more, but the Chronotus is now just on earth. The man's like- an escape convict. <laughs> But, you know, this this raises, it raises a very interesting point, okay? And I don't think we've we've ever had to address it before because, as you said, the last time we saw something like this was with Campo Rapoche, hmm. you know? And it's that the Doctor is very... He, he's anti-establishment when it comes to Gallifrey, when it comes to the Citadel. So obviously he seems to like gravitate towards other time lords that are also kind of anti-establishment. Like fucking uh, Campo Rapoche, he went off and he just became became a Tibetan Zen priest mm. and just told you know, gave told everyone beautiful speeches. <laughs> Whereas Cronotus, as a like Sally even had the power to basically control anyone he wanted. Anyone he wanted. And after getting captured and escaping from a high max prison, became a professor of an obscure subject in a Cambridge college and stayed there for however long. Yeah, and we'll get more into this when we talk about Cronotus himself. Yeah. But the bit I think the episode overlooks is he did also wipe the memory of every Time Lord ever to cover escaped. the fact that he escaped from prison. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't He didn't get rid of like the memory of Sally Avon. Yeah. He got rid of the memory of the prison hmm. where other people were also being kept. <laughs> but like... Which is a bit so, fucked up. <laughs> I, no, no, it, it is. But like... See, this is the thing, though, again, where it kind of, it does raise an interesting little po- uh, little point. It raises an interesting point where we know that there are very, like, we we talked about the Doctor just being anti-establishment, but we've mm. seen it before that there's very authoritarian standards within the Citadel. Mm. And, like, what's the degree of criminality that they view? Like... Like, like, he's a notorious timer. Was he just a prankster that used his abilities? Or is he on the level of Morbius? I don't think he's on the level of Morbius. But, well, like, I, I think we'll probably we, like, shift this conversation yeah. maybe to Knoss. My, my, point, my point being, just, just to wrap it up, is yeah. I was surprised he just left him there. With no comment and no, you be careful now. Um, mm. Particularly since the man's memory is going. Um, but see, this is, and like, yeah, and I, and I, and I, no, I agree with you, but like, I'm not trying to, when I say, oh yeah, but this, it's not like I'm kind of countering it. Like, 
there is a small bit of a, a finagle here in terms of the plot that kind of muddies that a small bit. Yeah. Which yeah. we'll get to more when we talk about Which we, it. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think about the Doctor in this one? Ah, right. So, um, now, Doctor, I know you have an intimate relationship with the TARDIS, but please always ask permission first when using that particular entrance. <laughs> because <laughs> the doctor says after he emerges from the storeroom sorry for barging in your back door that way old girl or something to that effect like that is one of two very fucking suspect lines in this story the other one is what Cronota says I'm going to do something to you but you can't tell anyone <laughs> it's like Jesus Christ between that and beating a robot's cock it's a very <laughs> Interesting story. Christ, the 80s were so different. <laughs> um, outside of that, though, I thought it was a very good showing from the Doctor. Mm. You know, um, Nice to see him fighting from underneath because it always increases the stakes. It, yeah. <laughs> it sell, it like, again, it kind of sells the threat of the villain. Mm. And Skagger, like we'll get to him, whatever. I think Skagger's a pretty good villain. Mm. Um, we're great. Like, I loved his logic battles with the ship. They were really entertaining. Mm. There is just this, um, uh, like, just the whole thing. And he, he keeps using, like, like, fractions. I've been clever by, I've been too clever by three quarters. He's been too clever by seven eighths. And it's just, um, but I, I really enjoyed his thing with the ship. And I think that's partially why I want to discuss the ship as a character. Um, but as well, his dynamic with Skagra as a villain was really, really good. Yeah. And like, you can tell, like, that the Doctor, as, like, Skagra is someone that clearly only converses with people that are, like, or at least deem, like, deigns to have a conversation with someone that he deems to be some bit intelligent. Mm. But the Doctor frustrates him. And the other reminds me of Alan Grant and Ian Malcolm from Jurassic Park. <laughs> I know, and it's not just the fact that Skagra wears a hat, and so does fucking Sam Neill in that movie. But, but it's like it's the chaotic nature of the Doctor slash Ian Malcolm, you know, and the kind of the stoic. I go by the evidence side of things of uh, Skagra and Alan Grant, but um, no, like, it was just really good here. The, um, the hodgepodge of the scientific helmet, you know, the colander on his head. I uh, thought that was really good. Um, I really like. I like his dynamic with Romana, like the, the the bit where they're on the boat. Whatever about the process of filming that scene, the editing and the acting of it was great. Mm. It they they just feel like such good friends now at this stage. Yeah, you know. I would say it is framed a little. I think just because of the way that she's hunkered down the boat. Yeah, you are kind of like, okay, I can see why you two got together. Um. Yeah, <laughs> there, there is there there is like that element like that you know, that subtext there, all right? Mm. But um, no, like they're just like, like this is where like like had th- had this come out, whatever, or had this been there, then probably yeah, like I think I can see now why a lot of people kind of really gravitated towards Romana too, like from this story, you know, mm. um. But like again, it's just I think it's the relationship of the Doctor and Romana too here. Um, there was one other thing that kind of came into my head was, and I think it's more so for like a discussion with Chris, but it's just this constant like of you think you think you know everything, you like, you really don't, or you have to unlearn what you've learned type yeah. scenario. Um. Which is like, you know, sometimes it can be mean spirited, but here I don't think so. I mm. think he was, I think it was for an educational purpose, the stuff that he was saying to Chris. Uh, so, all in all, no, good performance, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, as always, next we have the bestest boy, and then we have K9. Who <laughs> j- <laughs> and Romana, because, <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's do Bestest Boy first, because I don't have a whole lot on Bestest Boy this time around. Yeah, same here. Other than, so for K9 this time around, I mean, K9 is Bestest Boy, so he was Bestest Boy as mm. always. 
the one thing that this story more than any other really shows for me though is K9's power levels are so fucking arbitrary. Oh my god. <laughs> he was shooting one of those crags for fucking ages. Ages. And like nothing mm. was happening to it. It was just absorbing the power. Mm-hmm. And then finally he's like, oh, I, I'm low on battery. Whereas like we've seen in previous stories kill three people and that's low on battery. Like, his power level yeah. is so fucking inconsistent. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I was like... It, it sort of reminds me of like jumping the timeline massively like in a school reunion where like he can do like high power defense mode for like 30 seconds and then he's like yeah ah, poop <laughs> about a battery <laughs> <laughs> and it's like but like it, it's the trouble of having a robot dog with a gun mm. in his nose because they clearly didn't have like a show bible that said this is what K9's power levels are. K9's power levels are like Worf's strength. They're whatever they need to be to get across the point you're trying to make. Yeah. <laughs> so either he can bend steel or he's taken down in a wrestling contest with Deanna. Like, it, like it, it, you know, whatever the story needs, that's what it is. Mm. And, and for some reason, this one, it really highlighted it for me and I don't know why. <laughs> but other than that, you know, he was bestest boy, doing bestest mm-hmm. boy stuff. Uh, I'm amazed you didn't say the thing that I'm about to say is like, how dare they pick him up and fling him around? He's only little. That was rude. That was rude. But at the same time, this is going to sound weird. I didn't mind it because it showed. Oh, sorry, it showed how the crags saw him as a threat, mm. and so chose to get rid of him because if usually when K nine is taken care of, it's done off screen. Yeah, by like the um, the stones of blood. Like, yeah, they exactly. really did, they really fucked him up. They really fucked him up. So here at least we see something being like okay, the shooty dog thing <laughs> is hurting me. I'm bigger than it. I will pick up shooty dog thing and fuck it into score. <laughs> Which I kinda didn't like obviously I feel bad for K9, but I also like from a like storytelling point of view, I'm like, yeah, why don't like we can tell that Lala or Lala we know that Romana can carry him. So why don't mm. more things just pick him up and fuck him into a corner? <laughs> well, to be fair, it actually ended up being advantageous for the Crags to get being shot by K9 because they just absorb his thing and they become big fucking bombs. <laughs> flaming bomb yeah, murder machines. Yeah, but uh, if each one is alive, then that's a bit shit. Mm. <laughs> I don't know if I'd want to become a mm. kamikaze bomber without my permission. Mm. <laughs> Go on. What are your other toys? Toys? Toys on the toits. bestest boy? <laughs> um, like that was kind of pretty much it. Like he's there's there's nothing new from him here in terms of any sort of skill or any tor- sort of character relation. Mm. But I think one thing that and it's possibly helped by the animation, seeing Kane in an animated form, mm. is it does bring back that suspension of disbelief that we kind of lost with David taking over the voice. Mm. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah. So that's pretty much it for the, for the best of spoilers this time around. Cool. Then we have Romana. Time tot, Romana. <laughs> really, that's the kind of weird statement that causes confusion between Gallifreyans and Time Lords. Hmm. Also, time tot just doesn't sound like a word that should come out of Romana's mouth. No, but to be fair, blame Douglas Adams for that. Like, yeah. Um. Interestingly, in terms of like, you were saying that like watching this had this actually aired at the time you would have seen why people were so into Romana 2 and the Doctor. I kind of disagree because like, the boat scenes are cute and whatever, but like after episode one and even during episode one, Romana doesn't do a lot. Um, Because I, I saw it in your face when I said it. I'm just talking about more from like the, like that, 
the Doctor, chemistry perspective. I the, suppose. The, the chemistry perspective. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. In terms, into in terms of like, oh, this Romana two was excellent. Yeah, I have thoughts on that. Yeah. But from the chemistry perspective, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Because like she doesn't really do a lot here, and I think personally compared to last week, I think it's a weaker story for her. Mm. It's by no means the weakest story, I don't think, and we'll you know, we'll see when we eventually get to that point if it appears in the rankings or whatever. But certainly weaker. Like I was trying to think, what does she do on her own that isn't just being someone who gets talked at? So Skagra just brings her along to mm-hmm. info dump on her, mm-hmm. or following through on very intelligent plans that the doctor came up with mm-hmm. that she doesn't even really think will work. And I was like, okay, but like, where's her own inhibitiveness and intuition? And there's actually a line in it that actually really pissed me off because I was like, okay, you're now getting away from like, so far away from who Romana was originally in my mind, which is when Romana says that she's used, that she used to cite the oath but she didn't ever pay attention to it. Mm-hmm. You know, like, you know, controversial, whatever. In school, when you used to have to say prayers before lunch, and you would just, like, recount it by rote without actually knowing what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Or understanding or listening or believing what you're saying. And that's, to me, that's not true to Romana when we first met her. Yeah, it, it felt very retconny. Like, like Rom- this is her personality the whole time. Like, Romana, when we first met her, top of her class at the academy, very intelligent, knows technologies, inside out and back to front, particularly modern technologies, older technologies, a little bit, you know, whatever. But, like, she was meant to be the ideal Time Lord. Mm-hmm. You know, this is what a Time Lord out of the academy should be like. And yeah, over time, she grows compassionate. She grows understanding. She lets her hair down a bit more. She has a bit more fun and whatever. But here, it sort of makes it out that she was this bored schoolgirl who didn't really pay attention in anything. And, you know, she doesn't know who Sally Avon is or she doesn't know what this is and she doesn't know what that is. And I just sort of felt that it really undermined her character and at no point in the story is she being given the opportunity to show her intelligence like Skagra didn't even ask her to read the book Mm -hmm. to see if she knows what the clue is like he doesn't even think of her as being that he just brought her so what she can fly the TARDIS he seems to be able to do that on his own uh, I I got to say sort of here that I think it's kind of reflective also of Claire mm. from a certain other person's point of view. She's a woman. Yeah. <laughs> that that's that's how it comes across. She's just there. Yeah. And like I said, like even like I was really looking forward to when we had Romana and Claire in the mm-hmm. other Tardis, and I was like, this is going to be great. Because Romana will come up with some fucking amazing idea and you've Claire who has this knowledge being like this this TARDIS can't do that. This mm-hmm. TARDIS is like a type twelve. It can't do what you want it to do. And like the two of them signs in the shit out of it. And instead we got two women trying to hold down levers. Mm-hmm. And that's it. And I was just like, uh not the best. No. Not the best. Or, like, I was looking forward to, like, when the Doctor went off to find the book, I was like, oh, we're going to get Romana and Cronotus. This could be fun. This could be... Thinking back to last week with the guy whose name I've forgotten, but the the Daedalus character of last week. Oh, uh, Cezanne. Cezanne, yeah. I was like, oh my god, we're going to build on that. We're going to see more of that happening. This is going to be great. No. You man fucking dies. Well, Romana's getting milk. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know I've like I said I I think this story had great potential for her but instead she was just there no no I I, I agree all right um and as I said like I my, my point of view was just from the chemistry aspect of it mm. um but no I agree it's a it does seem like a massive step back for Romana uh I didn't actually pick up on what you were saying about like her 
oh, doing this too, like, um, because I was bored. It does feel very retconny to try and make her seem more like the doctor. Mm. You know, like, oh, he didn't really care about academics, so neither did I, you know, that type of shit. Um, It's like you're trying to be cool to your brother's friends or something. Mm. Um, But, like, she still has the protective nature in her interactions with Cronotus. And like you, I liked uh, her teaming with Claire. But in both capacities, it was like she was usually a babysitter Mm. or she was a hostage for someone else's gain. And like the only thing that she did to drive the plot forward in any capacity was when she reminded the doctor that his brain imprint was inside Skagra's sphere. Yeah. That's the only thing that she does to contribute to the overall resolution of the story. But he would have remembered eventually. According, well, according to her from last week, you would have remembered eventually. Well, yeah, but also <laughs> he, he would have yeah. remembered. Like that's not something no. unique to Romana. But I, like K9 no. could yeah. have said, anyone could have said that. Yeah. And it would have had the same so, effect. Yeah. So, but I'm just saying like, that's the only, mm. if you're looking for something, that's pretty much it. Um, so yeah, like it's. I think like it's kind of fair to say that this is, like definitely since Sarah Jane, mm. this has become the norm for, the companion characters, they get a head of steam going and then the legs are cut out from under them and they have to get that leg head of steam going again. Yeah, like it's not her worst. No, no, I I think it's I think it's far from her worst, but I don't see this cracking cracking the top three. Oh God, no. Unless the stories that are still to come on, are on, 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 like, fucking dog uh, we're, like, we're like, we're struggling for something to fucking throw in there. Yeah, like, yeah. It, it, I know we were saying that, like, you know, Graham Williams didn't like the horns of Naimon and whatever, but, like, I Romana did. last week hmm. was, was on really, fire was really... in comparison yeah. to this week. Roma- Romana last week was, like, a nice combination of Stones of Blood and Entrance of Tower, Romana, I think. Yeah. And here it's more power of crawl. Yeah. Although to be fair, less damselly. Yeah. More Armageddon factor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are hundreds of boys out there dying for it. <laughs> uh, okay. So now we're on to the prominent character section. Uh, so we have four characters. Uh, we have Ship, Claire, Chris, and Cronotus. And do you have a, a preference for the order? Nope. Because I would kind of go, like, my personal hierarchy of these characters mm. would be Ship, Chris, Claire, then Cronotus. Okay. We can do them in that order. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. In order of liking, I put Chris down at the bottom, but uh, <laughs> Ship would go first because uh, I think Chris has a bit more impact. So Ship, if you have thoughts on Ship. So... I forgot to write down my thoughts on ship because I don't know why. I, I also didn't look up who voiced ship because I forgot. Um, I do have thoughts on ship. Ship is an interesting character because the ship has been so cut off by Skagra to make it pretty much stupid. So, like, the ship is very powerful. It can almost move within itself in this sort of cuboid shape it can transport people it can be invisible it can do functions independent of Skagra Skagra is all voice operated but (laughs) the logic that it lives by is so fucking strict to the point where Skagra's belief is logic Skagra's belief is true that it has co- it has made the ship dumb <laughs> because the doctor's like, well, Skagra believes I'm dead, and if Skagra's always right, therefore I'm dead. Mm. Oh yeah, then you're dead. I was like, no ship, no. And like every now and again, you kind of get like, I was kind of like, okay, is the ship somewhat sentient in the sense that like it's trying to do the right thing, but it's also mm. not because it's like you. Know, well, if you're dead, you don't need oxygen, do you? It's like, well, you were keeping the oxygen on the whole time. Why are you suddenly turning it off now? 
<laughs> you're just doing this to fuck with him. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, I think it's an interesting ship. It does remind me in a way, like in the Sarah Jane Adventures, there's another ship called Ship. Um, mm. That is in many ways quite similar. Um, I think done a bit better. Um, mm. But as an- another talking, interactive, mechanical being, mm-hmm. it was interesting to watch. Mm-hmm. How about you? Uh, so just before I give my thoughts, the actress's name was Shirley Dixon. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's been in a few things, the Bridget Jones uh, franchise, uh, episodes of like the Bill Cavity QC, Inspector Morse, things like that. Her voice reminded me of the voice of the Keeper of the Crimson Chapter from. It did Saturday. a bit. You were true. That... You were true. You were right. It did a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure you're also true. You were right. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, sh- I uh, the one thing I would love to have seen would have been an interaction between Ship and K Nine. Yeah, I'm surprised been... they didn't write that because that seems like something w- Douglas Adams would have written. Yeah, I think I think it would have been nice, because um, it, it would have reminded me as well of K Nine and the ringing phone from Armageddon Factor. Um, but like, as well, like because like you talk about the thing of like you know the sentience, the the level of sentience that ship has, mm. and I agree like that it does feel like it was deliberate like stunted by Skagra because Skagra just sees it as a tool mm. more so than anything else. Whereas, like, the whatever all the adjustments that the doctor made to ship gives it a like it seems like it's developed um, a lot more agency, mm. and like that's why, like, at the end, I don't think it's just you know, a ship swapping out Skagra for the doctor in terms of like, oh, the doctor's my master now. I think the ship enjoys the fact that it gets to keep Skagra prisoner. Mm. I think I think there's an element there of like you know, you crippled me, so now let me tell you about all the ways in which I am better and you'll never own me again type thing. Mm. And I I feel like having a conversation between K nine and Ship would have been very interesting because it would have been a great learning experience for for you. Was it that son of a bitch made me do what type thing? Um. So no, like I I I thought it was a really kind of cool thing to introduce in the story. Mm. Uh, cool. So, Chris next. Poor Chris. <laughs> He's clearly in over his head by like a million percent hmm. in a situation that disproves everything he believed to be true. Like, he says at one point that, like, the night that this story happens, he was meant to be presenting a paper he had written proving that life does not exist on other planets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah which is funny um in his defense like he does get on with it though do you know what i mean like he has no clue what they're talking about he has no clue what they're doing but like he he's there he'll help in whatever limited way he can even if it makes him look like a dope um the thing about him that's probably the most annoying though is like he's not claire <laughs> claire's just better Hmm. do you know and in his interactions with her at the beginning which is all animated by the way hmm. his interactions yeah. with her at the beginning he seems to sort of belittle her he refuses to call her by her fucking name which which is a, hmm. which is a weird combination because he seems to belittle her a little bit or at least not take her comments as seriously he's like yeah i did try to x-ray a claire yeah whatever Except he calls her by her last name, <laughs> which usually in that type of situation, him calling her Keekly would have sort of seen that he sees her as one of the boys. Yeah. Which would have suggested he had more respect for respect her. Respect for her. Whereas calling her Claire would have been like, he's a, you know, he's emphasizing that she's a woman. I don't know. I just, like, I thought at the beginning, I was like, are they going for, like, are, are these two meant to be a couple? Or whatever. And I'm like, oh, Claire, you deserve so much better, my love. Mm. Like, he's not a bad guy in general. Do you know what I mean? Like, he's a bit of a fool, but he's grand. 
Um, but I'm like, she just looks better. <laughs> yeah. What What did you think of him? Because you said that he'd be like lowest yeah, on like, your list. I, I like this is the thing. It's like that. I like I get that he is out of his debt, debt here a lot, but for uh, the majority of the story, to me, he comes across as a bit of a bell end. <laughs> Like he really does, and again, like as you said, like it mainly comes down to his treatment of Claire, mm. because like it's like I don't know whether it's intentional or not, but he acts as if he acts like she is less intelligent than he is. Mm. So like that, whenever she makes the suggestion, "Did you do this?" Well, of course I did this. Did you do that? Did you...? And then she's like, "Did you think about asking him about it?" And he clearly hadn't. Mm. Yeah, like he, that was, and like the way he tried to come make it come across, like you know, it was like, oh, it was a pride thing. It's like, no, you actually didn't think to do the most fucking obvious thing. Oh, also, you're like smart move genius. The fucking thing blows up an X-ray machine, and your immediate thing is to touch it barehanded. Like I, like I am not a scientist. I am like really like fucking dumb when it comes to science, and Trish will kind of attest to that in certain aspects, but. Even I know, like, when I see x-ray, I'm like, I'm not going anywhere involving an x-ray that isn't properly lead-shielded. Well, bearing in mind, right, hmm. whoever wrote this and staged this also had their x-ray machine essentially be a microwave. Yeah. With no protective shielding. Like, he didn't wear hmm. any protective shielding or anything. Um, So I would... I think even if he was intelligent and he was presented as such, he probably would still have done the same. I think, yeah, I think to your point, like I think the bit that probably gets me the most is when Claire is trying to tell him, hey, by the way, <laughs> there's something fucking up with your friend because <laughs> he looked me in the eye and now I have all this knowledge. <laughs> and he just sits there and, like, and she tries to say, and he's like going, oh, they're treating us like kids, you know. and, and But like, he's also... And the one it is as well is that like another aspect of it is that I to me it comes across like he doesn't like the idea that there's anything beyond his comprehension. Mm. Like when a, the a canine says that for all intents and purposes, Cronotus is dead, mm. but the heart is still going, and that he waxes philosophical about how it's better not to know if there is such a thing as an afterlife, despite the fact that. It's a question that science wants to know. And then there's like the thing of when they had, they go on to the the research hub and the mm-hmm. doctor identifies it via the, um, the acronym on the wall and it says ADS. And he goes, oh, does that stand for Advanced State of Decay? Or ASD, sorry, it's Advanced State of Decay. But he says it in a joking manner. Mm-hmm. And it's like, just admit you are out of your depth. Like, and like, and there's only one time in this entire story that he does something that I genuinely admire him for. Mm. And that's when he tries to distract the crag so the doctor can get the sign, the, um, mm. the five old fellas out. Like he tries to bare knuckle box this thing. Yeah. And that's the, I think that's the only genuine time where I'm like, fair play to you. Yeah. My thing is that like, I mean, I agree with everything you're saying. And I think, I don't think he's a bad person. I don't think he's anywhere near as close to some of the people we've seen in previous stories. No, I think no, for the like, most part, he's grand. Do you know what I mean? He seems like, like he's a nice not... enough guy, but he's he's very caught up in his books and his view of the world. Hmm. Like he's not like compare him to Captain Knight from uh, Web of Fear. Mm. You know, what's a girl like? What's a nice girl like you? doing this thing and she's like oh i wanted to be a scientist he's like oh no women can be in science but clearly like you know i'm a bit smarter than keatley and it's like no man you're not you're really not (laughs) which i think is a nice segue into yeah claire (laughs) um claire you're awesome even more so with your hair down um but chris is holding you back my love (laughs) (laughs) like also, I need to point this out, right? That woman is nosy as fuck. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, she gets to Cronotus's, um rooms. He's mm. not there. She goes in anyway. Okay, whatever. She then starts looking around for 
fucking what exactly? We don't. Is she looking for the book? At one point, she finds a key and is like, "Ooh, like stop opening his drawers, woman! <laughs> what are you doing?" Mm. Um, so I'm like, okay, bit nosy, but right. Um, I think Claire more so than Chris is better at taking the whole thing in stride. Mm. She does even though I would call it being nosy, she does more investigation on her own. Um, And even though, like, until Cronotus puts his mind in hers, she can't really contribute that much. She's still trying. Mm. And she's like, I'm a quick learner. Teach me what it is you need me to do. He's like, oh, if only you could do this, because it takes two people to do it. And she's like, well, teach me and I'll do it. Do you know, there's none of this like, oh, this is beyond me or, oh, how can this possibly exist? She's like, this is fucking cool. I want to help you. How do I help you? Do you know? And she doesn't, like, even though like there are moments where like, they're like, you know, Claire, sit down, hold your breath. And she's like, okay. <laughs> like, she gets like really panicked. But like, I think she goes with the flow a lot more. Mm-hmm. I will say though, that there, she does spend a lot of the story doing nothing similar to Romana and merely just being there for others to bounce off of. Yeah. Um, and I feel really shitty that the doctor falling through the vortex or whatever was caused by A, her hand getting hot mm. and her choosing to let go, but also her letting go by like the whole thing where the two of them let go of the levers to reach a pencil I would like to point out something. Romana, you're wearing a hat. Mm. Also, if a pencil could hold it down, why did you say it was getting really hard to hold the lever down? That whole bit? Dumb writing. Um, Mm. The question I have at the end, though, is did they take the information out of her mind? (laughs) About like the information as to how to work the the machinery with inside mm-hmm. that arcade. Well, she says that it seems to be slipping away from her. Yeah, because again, think forward mm-hmm. to revival era yeah. and whatever, and I'm like, yeah, like it's slipping away, but at the same time, is it still there in the background? Maybe. Like when Cronotus finally bites it, is she going to be like, cool, I'm going to get a job in Cambridge and move into his rooms and yeah, I've got a TARDIS. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's a fail safe switch that once Cronotus goes, everything like that winks out. I don't know. I quite like the idea of Claire just sort of wait, biding her time until the old man yeah. bites it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do you one better. I like the idea of like her becoming a companion of Cronotus. Oh, yeah. And- but like, and him, be, him being cheeky enough and kind of going, you want what? I may be confined to Earth, but I don't have to be confined to this time period. Yeah. <laughs> um, I said this to Trisha earlier on, but it's in relation to when Claire takes her hair down. It's true what they say: nerds are sexy as fuck. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's like, it's like for all the world, it's like one of the Charlie's Angels pretending to be like a teacher, and then once. You know, they're doing the investigation thing. Down comes the hair flick and... <laughs> which one? Uh, so which, which, which angel is Claire? Who were the original three again? Got... Kelly, Sabrina and... Um... Kate? No. Nope. Jill? No, Jill replaced Farrah Fawcett. Right. Why do I not know... What Farrah Fawcett's character's name was? Because Jill replaced her uh, original Charlie's Angels were uh, thank you uh, oh, give me the original ones you stupid piece of crap Sabrina Kelly and Jill. Is it Jill? I thought Jill was her sister. No. Jill. It is Jill. Then who the hell was the sister? Chris. It was Chris. Okay. I haven't watched season one of Charlie's Angels in a long time. Mm. So. 
Back on track. <laughs> Would Back she have track. been I, Jill, I, I, Kelly, or Sabrina? I think maybe Kelly. Hmm. I think so too. Oh, yeah. Oh, bear in mind, I haven't I would say either Kelly or Sabrina. Um, mainly because Sabrina yeah, is my favourite. But I think she's a bit too... She's a bit too soft for Sabrina. Yeah. Plus you're a massive Kate Jackson fan as well, so... Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, Greek mythology and Kate Jackson, Patricia's other loves. <laughs> um, like, I'm not fucking one to talk. I'll watch anything with Sean Bean or Bruce Campbell. <laughs> short haired brunettes. Uh, um, but yeah, my thoughts were clear other than the fact that mm. you know she glowed up, I believe, as the kids say these days. <laughs> um, like the thing is, well, she's got brains, brains with a fucking bucket load as well. Like, she does extra tests on the book outside of what you know, like Chris did the test that he thought of and then called her and pretty much said, Well, I've done all that. And it's like, Okay, I've opened it, we... I've closed it, I've attacked it with a yeah. pencil. Yeah, uh, and she's like, like, okay, we'll just carbon date the thing. <laughs> and it's like, like, did you, did he, like, there's so much that he didn't think of that she did, you know? Um, but again, I also love the fact that she just throws herself into working on the TARDIS console with Cronotus. And she's like, you know, like, yeah, I don't know what it is, but like, I'm willing to learn and I, I can learn. Just, excuse me, show me what I need to do. And, I think once, I think once everyone kind of reunites, like so, once the Tardis crew and the Cronosis Tardis crew reunite as such, it kind of becomes a case of too many cooks, mm. and unfortunately, as we've said, the two girls take a back seat to things mm. in various capacities. Um, but it's great to see her involved in the resolution you know because she runs out and i don't get how they managed to only isolate the electronic current the electric current to just destroy the crags instead of the other people on the um, on the plat on the the metal grating i don't get that but she contributed to it um but at the end of the day like i would what everyone else was wearing rubber shoes oh, for fuck's sake <laughs> um at the end of the day, I would I would readily watch, listen to, or read any sort of spin-off material surrounding Claire and Professor Cronotus. I would agree. Because I, I think that there is definite potential there. I agree. So should we talk and, about the man himself? Yes, Mr. Sal Yavin. Because <laughs> like, that's the way it's spelt, and I get everything of Sal Yavin, and I was going, oh, look, it's Yavin. Um, I... <laughs> okay story time with Trish I got home yesterday picked up some McDonald's on the way sat down to watch Shadow and I was changing from my sunglasses because surprise surprise it's sunny in Ireland at the moment to my normal glasses and in between I was looking at my phone to see what the character list was and I read Chrono Tits <laughs> <laughs> Then I put my glasses on. I was like, oh, Cronotus. Fine. Um, it, call me dumb, but like the, reve- the reveal at the beginning that Cronotus was a Time Lord. You would think like with his name, it would have been like, oh, obviously. But I was actually like, oh, oh, cool. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> it actually is quite, it's quite enjoying it. Um, yeah. This is a man who is very generous with his books. He is too generous with his books. Hmm. Sir, keep a record of your books. It's like it's okay to loan books, but like you're very generous with someone you barely know. <laughs> you don't even remember his name. Hmm. Um, I think I've got two views of Cronotus. There's Cronotus episode one, episode two, and then there's Cronotus episode three and beyond. Cronotus episode one, episode two is adorable as hell. Mm-hmm. I love him. He's cute and like forgetful and I love his whole thing with the tea and everything. The way he is with Romana and the Doctor I think is brilliant. I love him. I think he's great. Mm. Cronotus from episode 3 onwards becomes very interesting. Mm -hmm. Because it begs the question, how much of Cronotus in episode 1 and episode 2 was an act? 
Hmm. Because for the rest of the story, he's not forgetful. He is very clued in and very engaged in what's happening. And it's like, I'd almost hate to say, but given that I gave the Alzheimer's analogy earlier, like that the sphere took away that version of him or that view of his mind, the forgetful part or whatever. And therefore this other self was hidden away beneath do you know um but it does beg the question given the fact that Sally Haven is an escaped convict how much of what we saw at the beginning was an act and how much of it was actually Sally Haven became Cronotus settled on earth however many years ago and has just gotten old do you know and I think it's a very interesting thing because I mean, to your point earlier, that when I was saying, like, they just left him on Earth, like this escaped convict, who did a terrible thing, technically speaking, like two terrible things, but the thing that I like, struggle to wrap my head around is he essentially wiped the minds of an entire species <laughs> to cover his own ass. <laughs> um, but it's interesting that he did that and then he went to Earth and just retired, just hung out, created a new persona for himself, made friends with the Doctor and some other people. Like, if you compare him to, like, because Sally Avon was the villain, we're thinking the Master, we're thinking the Meddling Monk, we're thinking, like, other Time Lords we've seen in the villain mm-hmm. role. I can't see any of them just going... Yeah, yeah, I've escaped. I want to go hide. I want to go mm. hide on Earth and become a lecturer. And yeah, and then he just like it, it. It's it's very fascinating, but my brain can't escape the fact that like he mind wiped the entire species. <laughs> Do you know? And mm. the fact that like he seemed fully content to go through the entire story, not revealing who he was. Because he says to Claire, don't tell anyone what I'm about to do to you. Mm-hmm. Right? Which is rapey as hell. Yeah. Um, poor dialogue. Poor dialogue. Poor, well-intentioned, but poor dialogue. Um, but, like, he says that to her. Like, she's the one who puts it all together. She knows who he is the minute people start talking about it later on. She's like, mm-hmm. like, it's going off. But he waits until the very end. To reveal who he is. Had they beat Skagra to Shada, had they, or just stopped him from getting there, would he ever have revealed to the Doctor who he really was? Or would he have continued to live the lie that he was Cronotus? I think he probably would have continued to live the lie. And it, so it makes him a very morally ambiguous character. Because at the end, he's still adorable as hell. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Do you know? Um, but yeah, so like for me, I think he's a very interesting character. Mm-hmm. And I actually have an anal- uh, an analogy for him mm. to an extent. To an extent, uh, but first, my uh, initial thoughts: Yes, he's as cute as hell. I would gladly be his companion just to live in that specific TARDIS, like with all those books and the never-ending supply of tea. <laughs> you know, I'd bring your own fucking, list, though. Yeah, I'd be on top of the fucking world. Um, I love his relationship with Claire. As mm. I said, I can see that as a spin off project for. I know the actor is unfortunately past now, but like I could have seen it as a, a spin off project for Big Finish or mm. something along the lines. Because um, it is very Doctor Companion ish. And I think he never speaks down to her. No. He, he doesn't. Like, he sees the potential in her. Mm. So that, like, you know, I can. And I just think that I'm wondering is that, like, could he have done that with, let's just say, like, Harry? I think he could have done it with anybody. I don't know if he would have, though. Or is it is it much easier when, when the person has a f- understanding of basic fundamentals of a certain topic that he's trying to I don't know. Like, I get, I get the on. feeling, because, I mean, that's the whole idea of why Skagger wanted to find him in the first place. Hmm. is to push thoughts on others. Yeah. 
So I think uh, he could have done it to anybody. But I think if we had, if we replaced Sarah Jane or Harry or Jamie or Victoria or anyone else into that scenario, I don't know if he would have. Mm-hmm. Do you know, I think, you know, the sciencey type characters we've had, I think he would have no problem. I think some of our more um, clued in characters, shall we say, mm. he probably would have. Um, like Barbara, yes. I think even Stephen, he probably would have. Just Stephen used to be mm. a pilot, you know. Yeah. He probably would have not. I usually rag on Stephen, but I'll give him mm. credit where it's due. Um, yeah. Maybe even Ben, mm. but maybe not Polly. Because Ben, again, focus on order and, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, would he have done it with Chris? Yes, I think he would have. Um, if that's what you but, were getting at. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's what I was getting at. Um, but my analogy. Yeah. The actual, and not the DS9 version, but the actual Jean Valjean. I think he is very reminiscent of that character. Yeah. Someone who's someone in the sense that their crimes or their perceived crimes are blown way out of proportion. He stole a loaf of bread and he was sentenced to X amount of years in prison, you know, and then he is labeled as this horrible prisoner for fucking years to come. He is like, no, granted he's paroled, mind you, but he, um, but you know, he ends up like, you know, fucking having to escape again, takes on a new persona and becomes this altruistic mayor who has a factory that employs people. And he does all these things for good, despite the fact that he's this fucking criminal that people are still chasing down, you know? Mm. So that's who I'd compare him to like, in that capacity. So that's why I was talking about earlier on the authoritarian centers of the Time Lord Society. Like, what's the extent of Sally Avon's crimes? Like, what is it the fact that he's... We all know that, okay, we know that the Time Lords, the one degree or the other, have, like, psychic abilities. Mm. Some stronger than others, like the Master, to one extent. And now here we have another person, Sally Avon, right? Um, And it's like, right, did he try and go on, like, this all-conquering war path, like Morbius did? Has he tried to upend societies to his own benefit, like the Master? Or is he just, like, this prankster that takes things too far i think that's i think that's where i don't think you and i differ but i think that's where i can't buy your analogy because we don't have enough information Hmm. like for him to be placed in shadow which we find out is like the time the nastiest prison like that's where the worst the worst go Hmm. um suggests that at the very least, because bearing in mind, like the master could make you do things. Yeah. Salievan can put his thoughts in your head, yeah. which is actually quite different. Like it's one thing to hypnotize someone to encourage them to do something; it's another thing to override their mind. Yeah. Or, in the case of what he ends up doing after he escaped, to remove information from someone's mind. So I think that this would probably have to be, because from what I remember, mm. it, it isn't in the novelization. I would have to go into expanded lore. Mm. Like, was he thrown in there as a preventative measure? Like, sort of like a Professor X Jean Grey Last Stand scenario. He, too powerful to be let out in the actual world, confined. I'm not saying yeah. like, that he's, you know, fucking Snow White innocent. Yeah, but, like, but I suppose, my thing is that, like, the master was never put there. Yeah. Do you know? So yeah. the fact that Sally Avon was says to me at least that even if he was a trickster or whatever, the one trick he took too far, in my mind, was the most dangerous one. And the one that I see happening in my head, the reason why he had to be in this prison, that there's this book that is the key and the book is the law and whatever he tried to push his thoughts and his beliefs and his whatever on the Council of Time Lords. So he wanted to be able to be like the Doctor and go off and get involved and help him or whatever. But he showed that he could override, he could take over the government. Hmm. And they're like, oh hell fucking no. 
this isn't you having fun and whatever you tried to take over the government and that like the whole time that's what i was thinking in my head because like Hmm. when a man was like hold on you admire him it's sort of like he done something Mm -hmm. that was big and questionable and like again the doctor may say like oh like he was having fun with them showing them or whatever it's like you took away or overrode someone like someone's truest self like that's a very Mm -hmm. dangerous ability to have (laughs) and so in my mind and again we don't have any proof of this this is just like you see it as the jean valjean thing of he maybe did something that took it out of context my thing is given the fact that they didn't do that to the master i think even if he was having a joke i think he did something to the high council and they went fuck you I, I don't I think like I, I actually enjoy that I like I really like that idea. Partially because it reminds me of Loki in Thor Dark World and goes into Ragnarok, mm. you know, where he's pretending to be Odin mm. <laughs> and your favourite line of like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh no, it, like I actually know I like the stories that you come up with. I really mm. do. Um because in in one small capacity it's like he's trying to remove the st- like he's taking the joke too far, as you said. Mm. Um but to me, I think that he's like I would in my head, mm. the very valid point you raise and the outcome of what he did sparks to me the the notion that he's like, right, I've got to rein it in. Mm. I can have some fun but not too much fun. But it's too hot to fucking it's too hot to act like this. So tip off to some backwater and just chill out. Yeah. Like, I do think by the end of it, he is Kronotos. And mm-hmm. that is who he is. Yeah. Um, And whether it's a case of being in prison changed him, whether it's a case of, you know, realizing that power corrupts. Mm-hmm. And realizing that you have this power. Mm-hmm. And you know, maybe it was by accident. Do you know, maybe he was having an argument with someone and he was like, why can't you see it the way I do? Glowy mm-hmm. yellow eyes. They suddenly mm-hmm. see it the way he does. And he's like, shit. Yeah. I think it could be either way. Um, mm-hmm. But I think at the end... I want to believe that he is Cronotus. Sitting in Cambridge making cups of tea. I, I, I think he's if you want to throw in the word reformed mm-hmm. I, I, I think he is like Salievan as people knew him as Salievan has gotten. All mm-hmm. that's left there is Cronotus now. And but there's another thing here like it kind of raises a question in like I was going to save it for the, the, the overall but I want to bring it up now is there's a there's an unexplained thread here, which is that Salieben's body disappears because mm. presumably he's dead. But he reappears when Claire activates the TARDIS, and he's and he says that like I'm caught between my time streams. So in my head, that this like the Cronotus at the end of the story is a younger version of Cronotus who hasn't gotten to the stage when we first see him in episode one. But they never explain or they never re-explore the idea of who sent the distress signal at the start. That is called Douglas Adams can't write for shit. <laughs> All right, okay, fair enough. I'm, I'm glad that... Like, this you know, is why I, wasn't I brought up in trivia that originally Coronotus was meant to just die in episode two. Yeah. But then Douglas Adams liked him so much he decided to keep him. I'm like, you did not think this through. Yeah. You did not think this through. <laughs> Do you know? And... Yeah. Who sent the distress signal? It could have been Cronotus at the end. Yeah. Sent it, knowing the Doctor would appear at some point. Mm. So, yeah. But, but like, again, it's a case of, like, you know, surely that would have been one of those things of don't forget to send that distress signal, you know? And he goes, I won't. At which point, well, what did he say again? Because like, then, like, that kind of leads into the joke of, mm. you know, I can't remember who said it. You know? But, yeah. No, that, that I just thought, again, it was just fucking poor writing. Mm. But a very fascinating character, yeah. I think. And like, it's always kind of fun, like when we have these things with like the morality of certain characters, you know, because mm. like it, it just makes it a good talk. 
So, speaking of the one and only of characters, <laughs> mm-hmm. the one and only Skagra. They wanted Bowie. Like they clearly wanted Bowie. <laughs> Dude could not give a fuck about subtlety. Like he's out there with the big, very with the white floppy hat, the, the disco boots. They clearly the wanted fucking, Bowie. <laughs> yeah, they really wanted Bowie. Um, I think Skagra is an interesting villain, um, in the sense that he has himself convinced that he doesn't want to rule the universe, hmm. ignoring the fact that he's the one choosing whose minds the sphere absorbs. And whose minds the sphere overrides. Mm -hmm. And also there's the whole thing of, you know, who are you to say that people should not live an independent life, blah, blah, blah. But like, there's so many interesting nuggets about him that only get explained in this throwaway under the console. It's like Tom in his like 50s chatting away. It's like... Even then it's not properly fleshed out. Because like, what we know about him in the story, from the story perspective, before that bit at the end, he can he knows what TARDISes are. He can pilot them, or at least understands how they function to a, a variable degree. He can speak and read Gallifreyan. He is a super intelligent being. He has control of this amazing ship. He has no problem going down to earth and walking through he can drive a fucking car he can like he has no problem with any of that and for most of the story like it up until the very end how does he know all this who is he where is he from because like the doctor says the ship is more advanced than anything the doctor's ever seen like it's amazing the level of technology that he has hmm. and so it makes it him very interesting because he's also cold and calculating Mm -hmm. he's not malicious or vindictive he just needs what he needs and he doesn't care who gets in his way to get that do you know um and i've already said but like his control of the ship is very interesting because the way he has set the logic of the ship shows how limited his imagination is and how full of himself he is. Hmm. His word is logic. He could never believe anyone would survive the sphere, therefore the ship cannot believe anyone survives the sphere, therefore the Doctor is dead, even though the Doctor is clearly not dead. Mm -hmm. And it's his own undoing. (laughs) He is literally taken apart by his own ego. Which makes him all the more interesting. And like, the idea, like when you look back on it, the idea that like he went to Cronotus to get the information, to get the book, and he treated him as like this nothing. I'm just here to bleed your brain, mm-hmm. not realizing who it was that like that's who he was looking for the whole time was stood right there. Which begs the question, could the spear not do the brain empathy thing the whole time? I don't know. Whatever. Um, but yeah, I think he's really interesting. I think his henchmen were irrelevant um, and pointless. He didn't need them. Um, and again, it's one of these things where it's not that the Doctor is powerless. The Doctor is almost nothing. He just fucking plows on through and just keeps like, Skagger is like, cool, I got what I wanted from you. I'm going to keep going. Bye. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> Zero shit's given. Uh, um, hmm. But he does also like the sound of his own voice. Oh yeah, big time. So how about you? So as I said, couldn't give a fuck about subtlety. No. Um, well, as you say, very confident in his own abilities. To the extent that he's a very subdued villain. Hmm. He's almost placid in his line delivery and his monologuing. Like, there's no... There's no rivers and valleys in terms, or you know, mountains he's, and he's valleys. He's not solid from last week. No, he's not. You know, he, he really isn't. He's just calm, cool, and collected. That is, until, like, so long as the odds are in his favor, or he mm. knows, you know, <laughs> you know, like he's playing you know, by the rules. But the minute you introduce something that's outside of his 
thought process or like the one factor that he didn't, you know, or the one he didn't factor in, sorry, you can see the cold sweat break out in him. Mm. Yeah. To the extent of like he knew, like he realized in a, in a battle of minds, he wasn't going to beat the doctor. Mm. That's why he was constantly having the crags to try and distract him so that he could get in, keep the dominance there. Um, I like it's interesting when we have solo villains, you know, mm. uh, because it, there's an awful lot of work on the villain and the actor playing the villain to make us believe that they're a viable threat. Mm. And I think the standard bearer for that is probably Sutek. Mm. Um, no, is Skagra as enjoyable a villain as Sutek? I I would say no. Mm. But he's definitely in the vein of someone that's a challenge for the Doctor. Mm. Someone that has a legitimately terrifying plan. And the stakes are there that the cliffhangers are, you know, like, it's like, what happens next? Mm. I want to see how they're going to stop this guy because he seems to have all the aces. Mm. And it was a really good performance by your man as well, by yeah, Christopher. Because it's it's almost like it's it's Bond villain esque, but in in a good sense, not not like you know, like ridiculous type shit or anything like that. It's just this this suaveness to him mm. that just reeks of cold evil. Yeah, I'd agree. So we've reached the end of the story uh, where I think I'm so tired from the six part that I'm blanking out what I'd normally say. We've reached overall the overall section. Five. Yes, thank you. We've reached the overall section of the podcast. We will give our final thoughts and each give our score out of five and see where the season ranking finally comes. I go first. Yes, you go first. <laughs> Overall, I did quite like the story. At the beginning, I was thoroughly enjoying it. Mm. As the story went on, though, there were a number of choices made that made very little sense to me. The fact that Shada is meant to have the worst criminals in Time Lord society, but most of the prisoners we see, and those I called out in trivia, are not actually Garel Freyan. Right. Yeah, no, that's a good point. <laughs> Half of the prisoners are humanoid, but they don't look human, or Gallifreyan for that matter. The whole thing with Cronotus being Salievan, I, th- I think it was poorly done. Like, they don't explain how he survived. And the whole, I'm between time, and why did his body disappear? Like, in a... No, no, it, it was very poorly done. Um... The Krags didn't add any value. Like, what even was the fucking point of having them? They just took up budget and whatever. No point. There there needed to be... Like, I made the comparison of Sutek. There needed to be the mummies. So there, there needed to be muscle. Yeah. I don't think they did, though. I don't think they did. The spheres were the deterrent. Hmm. Do you know? Um, the key to getting to Shadow... I, you read the book to the end. Really? Read the book while in a TARDIS and it'll take you to Shadow. That is some never ending story three bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> All I remember from that movie is your one reading the part where Sebastian kicks the shit out of Jack Black and all his cronies. Yeah. It's the bad one. It's the one that isn't based off of the book. As far as I remember. And this whole. The key to getting to Shadow. Is to read the book to the end. Is so fucking lazy. Like. What? No. No I'm sorry. Like that was ridiculous. Um, Like I said. The Doctor managed leaving Cronotus. Slash Sally Avon on Earth. Knowing he's an escaped criminal. Who rewrote the minds of every time. Lord in their society. <laughs> to hide the fact that he had escaped prison. Like, even if he's redeemed himself, like, one of you give him at least some bit of a lecture before you fucking leave for his sake. 
Mm-hmm. Particularly Romana. Like, okay, the doctor left. Like, Romana should have fucking said something. But but as pointed out at the start of this story, this isn't Romana. The, the way we know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, like, even with all of that, there was a lot in this I did enjoy. I liked Claire. I thought she was great. I did quite like the first two episodes. I thought they were really good. I was really invested. I was really entertained. Unlike City of Death, I actually didn't mind the setting. I don't think they overused the Cambridge thing that much. There was nice nods to it, but like there wasn't. Let's just run around for no reason. There was the cycle chase, and that was yeah. it. And that was at least interesting because there's Tom Baker on the bike. Um, yeah. So for me, I gave it a 3.5. I thought it was good, but there was a number of things where I was like, what the hell? And I I am going to stick by what I said previously. I do think Douglas Adams is massively overrated as a Doctor Who writer. Personally. But hmm. that's just my opinion. How about you? Um, no, I, so like, I really like this story. Um, I thought it was paced fairly well. Uh, some good performances from the supporting cast. And as I said earlier on, well, fair play to them for trying to recapture the character of the story from over 30 years previously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I just <laughs> realise now that uh, Queer Otis doesn't speak in any of the animated sections because the actor was dead. <laughs> um, uh, I would love to, as I said, like I would like to see some spin-off stuff for Queer Otis and Claire. I really enjoyed the Doctor here. Really good. Um, but it's, yeah, it has issues in it. Um, Chris can fuck off. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just like, I don't like him. This is a part of one point thing. I just think he's again, understandable where he's coming from, but he acts like a bellend. Um, the, on the unresolved plot thread and it's a, it's a thing i hate where like in one sense you know, it's fun because we can come up with head cannons and we can banter it back and forth but when the resolution to the plot kind of relies on it like it kind of needs to be fucking factually stated you know um so that kind of irked me a bit um the lack of use of romana and also to like the, the the stopping of use of Claire to a certain point, yeah, it fucking kind of you know it's it not kind of it sucked, um because it was great because now that I'm kind of thinking about it, like while there is no damsel in distressy moments here, it kind of fit in with what Douglas, apparently Douglas had said, which was they're they're not really meant to be the heroes of the story, which is which we said we didn't like at the time, and we still don't like it now, or at least I don't like it now. All things being said, though, like I still actually enjoyed the story, so I'm slightly harder to go on a four out of five. That is it? Yeah. Because this, like, and even, I think like a, where I may have been shaky on it before, I'm actually kind of firm on it now because of the conversation that you and I have had, because of the interesting morality discussion you can have surrounding uh, Sally Evans slash Cronotus and the Doctor's handling of the character. Hmm. So, do you want the averages? Yes, I do. I'm excited. Who, who do you think? Whose average do you think is higher for the season? Yours or mine? Um, I think I was going to be slightly higher. Not anymore. Ooh. I actually ended up with a higher average than you by point <sighs> zero one. <laughs> for fuck's sake. <laughs> Your average is 2.67 and mine is 2.68. And do you know what did it? What? Last week. There was a whole point in the difference last week. Because you gave Horns of Nine a 3 and I gave it a 4. I have a question. Just one quick oh, question wait, for on. you. I can't write. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Trish realized that she did a 5 and, or a 6 and not a 5 because it's dark. And she can't touch type. Oh, we're the same. Oh, Ooh, plot twist. Trish can't type, uh, and we end up being the same. <laughs> <laughs> I had someone in work actually telling me the other day, she's like, Trish, you're very honest when you work. That's what you mean. So I forwarded, an, I was trying to forward an email to a colleague. I instead forwarded the email to the person who sent it. 
<laughs> like I was doing it on a screen share and I was like, oh, that should have come through. And she's like, Trish, who did you just send it to? I was like, oh, damn it. So I replied <laughs> back to the forwarded email. And as opposed to being like, oh, hey, I'm so sorry I sent this. I was about to be like, I'm a moron. Ignore me. <laughs> <laughs> so my friend was like, this is what I mean by you're very honest. I would have been like all apologetic. And I was like, no, no, I'm an idiot. <laughs> just own it and move on um but yeah uh so yeah we're both on 2.67 because i was just taking a look to see where it was and i'm like yeah i can work out the maths of it there so does this make it the lowest ranked season uh no uh for me it's a tie between this and season 15 for you it's higher than season 15 um and then see sorry i get confused with the layout of the spreadsheet season 15 is uh, lila's first season or Lila's last season sorry lila's last season yeah so for me it's the it's on par with lila's last season which makes sense like Mm. season 15 had horror fang rock this had the horns of naiman um no not as good as horror fang rock obviously but no whatever um and for you this was higher um, not by much. Not by much. much. <laughs> <laughs> by point zero four. <laughs> um, but yeah, but it's interesting. I think, like, for us looking at it, you know, you know, we've said before, there's a lot of hype around this season. There's a lot of hype around Romana. A lot of hype around Douglas Adams. A lot of hype around Douglas mm-hmm. Adams, and Shada in particular. And I think, for me, what this reviewing this season highlighted was I don't, I'm trying to make a point my brain is like you're sounding so pretentious but I'm going to skip that just because there's a story or a season or a character that everyone else loves hmm. doesn't mean you will mm-hmm. it doesn't mean you have to yeah me and Paddy have watched every episode of Doctor Who right up to now we're both Doctor Who fans us not ranking this season as high as some others doesn't suddenly make us not Doctor Who fans because oh they didn't rank Shada 5 out of 5 it's like we didn't enjoy it yeah, that much we enjoyed it but not a 5 Um, and I think for this season the fact that we were still able to have like, I, mean, I think I mean and Paul our friend from Half Measures Podcast mentioned like this season has had some of our best discussions Mm. I think because we're trying to be like, what the hell was this? <laughs> yeah, um, and like, like this is the thing as well. Like, is that we've never shied away from the we we've never had kid held kid gloves to any story. No, and like, I think a good example of that is when we redid Pyramids of Mars within the timeline of the podcast, mm. because your opinion on the the final score like i think your final score stayed the same but your opinion as to why it changed mm. and that was down to the doctor you know and like you know you talked about the whole thing of where it's like we didn't like a specific story that's well renowned so therefore and like that the thing that comes to my mind is the image of the fendal mm. you know which is you know highlighted so much as like the last of the era and it's like it's a it, it's like a damp squib, you know? Mm. Um, so it's the, but yeah, but like it's the same thing like where outside of the show, outside of a show itself, like, you know, just in pop culture, if you don't like a certain show, just, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, that's not my particular cup of tea. It doesn't mean I have bad taste. It just means I have different taste. Mm. That's all. And I would say, like, for me, like, you know, ever since we started with Leela, I've been in unknown territory. Mm-hmm. Um, I hadn't seen any of these <laughs> before I watched them. And particularly this season, I was struggling to get into it because I missed Mary Tam as Romana. But I've really enjoyed our discussions on it. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah. I'm looking forward to discussions we'll have next season. Am I looking forward to Romana 1 next season? Not particularly. Um, I've just, I've, I've just come to accept that. Um, 
but I'm looking forward to next season and the discussions we're going to be having. Hmm. No, yeah, I am. Because see, this, the thing, this is the thing now, right? Where it's like, this was definitely a season of two halves. Hmm. And like the, the first half and the second half are night and day in terms of the overall quality. And I know that for um, kind of both of us, City of Death has a higher score than the other two parts, the other two stories in, that, in those first three. We, as we said before, we've attributed a lot to small aspects, mm. high scores to small aspects. Um, so it would be interesting to see if the trend of will the high score towards small aspects that we enjoy mm. of the story increase to a score, or will it be more along the lines of no, it's just not mm. whatever. Um, but what will be interesting is that at the end of the next season, there is going to be a big question asked of you, young lady. What's that? <laughs> the next season is Tom's final season. Oh, oh yes, it is. Yes, and for those that haven't heard before, uh, or they're new to the party, um, before we started this podcast, Trisha's favorite doctor was Tom, and he was also my favorite doctor. But after starting from the very start. We both discovered a new, a newfound appreciation and love for the first Doctor. Mm. We always had love and appreciation for him, but it was it grew. Mm. So now the question is: Is does he take the top spot? Mm. So we'll find out uh, it with the next season. Yeah. Now we're not going to be having an episode next week. Mm-mm. We'll be off next week, but we'll be back in two weeks' time with the Leisure Hive. Yes, because next week we're going to the theater. Yes, we are. Um. And actually, it's interesting that next week we won't have a rambling either because mm. Lala is continuing. Yes, she um, is. So it's going to be good to have a... Yeah, because obviously Mary only got one. So it's interesting yeah. now to have Lala running for going for two again, which would be, which would be mm-hmm. good. But yeah, uh, in two weeks' time, the Leisure Hive. Till then, guys. Like. Nice. <laughs> Bye. Bye.